Hi, my name is Erin Grewell and welcome to our live Freedom Forum. Today's guest is exquisite. She is the Congresswoman just north of the Freedom Riders headquarters and she represents the 44th district right here in California. I've had the honor of knowing our guest today for two decades. Um, Nanette is an incredible advocate and for years I've marveled at how she has been a fierce fighter for the underdog. So I love that she got to serve in Congress with our namesake, Congressman John Lewis, who encourages all to get into good trouble. And good trouble indeed. Year after year, Nanette has fought for voice, for advocacy, for independence and agency for all. She's a fierce fighter for equity. She's a fierce fighter in giving dignity to all. And she, at one point, sat on the Freedom Writers Board, allowed us to choose scholars, allowed us to empower dreamers, and allowed people to find their voice in the educational system. So it is such an honor and privilege to interview her in her office, knowing that she fights for all that the Freedom Writers hold dear. Without further ado, here is my courageous conversation with Congresswoman Nanette diaz Paragon. Congressman Nanette diaz Berrigan, I, I feel like this is a pinch me moment for me because I remember sitting around a table with like-minded folk and you announcing to the universe that you were going to run for Congress. And so for ordinary people who believe they can do extraordinary things, what does it take for someone like yourself to declare that you're going to run for Congress? and actually see that dream actualized? Well, uh, timing and opportunity is, I think, key, uh, but hard work and just making sure that we instill in our young people that they could be anything they want. And when I was a kid growing up, my parents were immigrants and never did I think that I would um, run for Congress one day. Uh, as an intern, I thought maybe I could work for a president one day, um, but, uh, it's amazing what happens when you pursue an education, you go to school, you study, you network, and you meet folks and, and work hard. So I tell our little, I say young girls, and I'll say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a nurse. I said, that's so great, but how about President of the United States? And you see their, their face light up and smile. We need to tell all our young kids that early on to instill that in them. To be a congressional member under a vice president who is a woman, what is that like now when you when you do encourage little girls that you could be a congressional member or you could be the vice president or the president? Do you feel like now it's much more tangible? I think having a woman there lets them visualize it better and easier so that they could see it in the flesh. And I think that's just so inspiring for our young girls uh, to see that. Um, but we got a little ways to go. We got to get, you know, a woman into the the presidential slot. Um, but we're at a good place now. And to see it be a woman of color just adds a whole nother dynamic and a layer to it that is really amazing. Especially in my district, where you have almost ninety percent Latino African American. So let's let's start there. Let's think of all these beautiful kids in all of these corners of your congressional district who are first generation. And I, I love that you are first generation. So for those that don't know what that term means, can you tell them with pride what it means to be first generation? So for me, first generation is my parents immigrated here and I was first born here. Um, but with that comes a lot of heavy responsibility, especially when you're in Congress, because I see it as a way to represent my culture, my heritage, our communities, not just here locally, but across the country. Um, but the experiences that you bring, uh, the experiences of our young people today, what they're going through, uh, their family life, their childhood, their struggles, will all help them down the line when they're at the table. And we need them at the table to be part of our policy makers and our decision makers. So um, it's, it's your time, right? It's your time for our young people, they are future leaders. So they can bring that experience with them. 
You know, as an, as an English teacher, I fixate on the power of words, and I hate how certain words can make people feel less than or marginalized. And I think when you and I were both in, in school, we would hear words like illegal, which just make me cringe. Um, and I prefer the term undocumented. So I know that that term undocumented is very dear to you personally. So can you tell our audience what what the dignity of using the word undocumented means rather than calling someone an illegal citizen or an illegal immigrant? Yeah, you know, this is something that is, um, it's very personal, um, given that, you know, I have family who's undocumented. And I like to just remind people, nobody's illegal. People may not have the documentation. Um, um, but, you know, these are people, and we should treat people that way. Um, and so we hear it a lot in committees in Congress. My Republican counterparts will use the term in a derogatory way to um, try to invoke a vision of criminality. And when you think about it, you know, immigrants built this country and there are processes for immigrants to come apply for asylum and those now are being criminalized. And people need to understand it is completely legal to present yourself at a port of entry and say you want to apply for asylum because you're escaping violence or some other condition, that, uh, some other circumstances that you're going through. So the word is is really um, used many times these days to um, try to criminalize, uh, characterize immigrants um, in a negative light. Um, so it's something that we've been working on trying to, to eliminate. That, that reminds me of a, a question I wanted to ask from a darling college student. Her name is Stephanie Santiago, and she is an undergrad at the University of California, Irvine. And she said, Congressman Berrigan, how do you feel about the portrayal of immigrants on news platforms that are false or unfactual and spread negative stereotypes and policies? Well, it's very hurtful, um, and it doesn't help our community. We need to unite, um, and we need to value uh, immigrants and what they bring to the table and to to really to our, our everyday life. When you, when you get to know immigrants, when they're your neighbors, when they're your friends, I think you have a different perception. And so if you look closely, um, you may not even realize that the person who is making sure that you are stocking your shelves at the grocery store um, may be immigrants, um, maybe the doctor um, in the hospital where you're getting care, or the medical staff, a lot of them these days are immigrants. We wouldn't have food on the table because you have people working in the farms, uh, picking the food that we so value right now in COVID and we can't find on the shelves early on are being put there by immigrants. So there's so many essential workers um, that right now uh, are immigrants that are helping us through this really challenging time. So I try to tell people, focus on that. And, you know, I'm going to share a very interesting story with you, Aaron, because I don't get to, outside of Congress, share very much. In Congress, we do these behind the scenes, private meetings with our colleagues on the other side. And what's astounding to me is when they tell me stories privately about somebody who came into their household who was an immigrant, maybe undocumented, who helped when they had their child and what that immigrant and that person means to their family. And I, I want to tell my colleague, and I have, share your story on how you've also relied on immigrants and in some cases undocumented immigrants. Don't make them criminals. And that's something that's very hard because politics then comes in and I hear, I can't share that story in my district. And that's really heart wrenching. What was it like to see then the, uh, a candidate Trump coming down an escalator 
And then the rhetoric he used that was so cruel and dehumanizing about Mexicans being rapists and and drug dealers and that gross generalization of of taking an entire swath of the Latinx community and just stereotyping them as Mexicans and in a really derogatory term. Well, I think it was hurtful for me personally, for our communities, um, but it also began to instill hate and division in this country. And we have seen since then um, the president likes to use immigrants as uh, the former president likes to use immigrants as his scapegoat. When something's not going right or doesn't know what to talk about, it, he goes right back to bashing immigrants. And what has led to over the course of years uh, was this violent domestic terror attack that we saw in El Paso, where you had somebody who wasn't even from El Paso drive there and commit a shooting at the Walmart, killed so many. That is what happens when we instill hate and division. And when you have the leader of the free world um, repeating those lies, characterizing immigrants that way. And um, we can't let that happen again. We just cannot. What I honor that you did is travel throughout the border states when families were being separated and, and kids and babies were being put in cages. So can you tell our audience, which is global, what that was like to be a caring humanitarian and a leader to feel so powerless and helpless with these children in cages? Well, I was embarrassed. Um, I was embarrassed and I was hurt that this was happening in our country and that you really couldn't do a lot. And I'll never forget when I was on the southern border and I was in a facility and there was a young girl I got on my knee to talk to her and her mother, and her mother says to me, my daughter is a U.S. citizen. She was born in New York. And she's in a facility that is not for citizens. And I was shocked. And the first thing I said was, can you prove it? And she had her passport with her. And the only way that I was able to get something done is I took a picture and I went public with it because the public outrage um, got them to release the mother and the child. But it shouldn't take that. We shouldn't, it shouldn't take a member of Congress being in a facility, going public. Um, but that's what it was like under the prior administration. Um, and the conditions that we saw in those facilities were um, pretty inhumane. And that's just on top of the separation that was happening. You know, we've seen kids and families traumatized for life. Uh, from the separation. Many of these kids thought their parents left them by their own accord, didn't realizing uh, that they were forcibly separated. And I can't even imagine what that does to a young child who made the journey, uh, in many cases a dangerous journey, to be separated. And, and then what was really heartbreaking were the very young kids who they, they were not allowed to be touched. They were not allowed to be cradled. And when, when kids cry and they're that young, they need that attention. They need that emotional connection. Um, and we saw in, in custody kids who were not allowed to, to be touched or given that affection they needed. And what that does to their development and the trauma is just, it's unimaginable. What was it like to be inside those detention centers and be able to be face-to-face -face with children and actually communicate in their native language and to f hear their stories firsthand, that it wasn't censored, that it wasn't, um, uh, that they didn't try to twist and turn it on the news. You were there face-to-face -face speaking with these children. Well, it was hard because we were told not to talk to the children or to the parents. And so sometimes we would have to defy um, the uh, the officials and saying, look, we're members of Congress, we're here to investigate. And so sometimes you would get pieces and stories. Other times in some of the facilities where they keep kids, um, they you got the sense that maybe they, they let you see the kids, like selected kids. Um, 
but to hear their their stories on the ones you you are able to talk to, um, to explain to them, you know, first that it's okay to trust me, because so far everybody they've encountered is somebody they can't trust, and so to be able to talk to them in Spanish and say, you know, I'm here to try to help, and um, to just most of them were asking about their their parents and when can they go home, and crying, um, and parents that were begging for help. I loved every time I turned on the news and, and saw you, your your righteous indignation, because it is right, righteous indignation. I, I think you you were allowed a firsthand glimpse there, but then you brought us in to that scene. So what was some of the most outrageous things that you saw? She, I think the conditions, the living conditions, um, these are prisons. These are not meant for children. Um, and certainly not very young children. Um, the unsanitary conditions, people living in tents, um, the smell when you walked in of what was, you know, people who didn't have air conditioning. They were in the heat. They were in the cold and didn't have, you know, enough to keep them warm, not showering, not having access to simple things like diapers. Or in one case, the mother who would say, we're getting one diaper a day. Mm. And what is that doing to the child? And that's just not how you treat a human being. So it was it was very hard, and it still is. Those, those are images that, that stay with you, um, and maybe for some good, because they're a constant reminder of how un-American that is and how we can't allow that to happen, regardless of who's in power. Under this administration, I'm going to be just as vocal um, in making sure that we're, you know, keeping families together and that we're providing humanitarian standards at the southern border. Speaking of the border, tell us about your new position and how things will be different now that you have a leadership position. So I'm now serving as the chairwoman of the subcommittee on homeland for the border, uh, which is amazing to me to have that opportunity to do that. But I get to run the meetings. I get to decide what hearings we're going to have on border issues. And under this administration, that's huge because we have the ability to have hearings about what is happening at these, I call them jails. They're called detention centers, but they are jails. And if you go look at them, they're no different than jails. To look at the conditions, to see what's happening, how do we move away from that into alternatives to detention? Um, Looking at programs like the Remain in Mexico program where completely inhumane program and you're keeping migrants down in dangerous conditions where people are being raped, they're being killed, um, they're being used by the cartels. And so we've seen the current administration move to eliminate it. Uh, But there's a lot of work to do on that, on reuniting families and making sure there isn't separation continuing to happen. Um, Because the reality is that there are different ways to separate families. And one of those is through what the, what the last administration did. And the other way, frankly, is when you are starting to deport people who've been here for decades, have their, all their families here, you deport them. Now you're, you're separating a family and you're breaking up a family. Um, so we need to find better ways um, to address the immigration system. That's something I think you're going to see in the coming weeks in Congress as well. You think... Your, your time in the courtroom as a, as a fierce attorney is going to help you be the chairwoman of this committee? No doubt. Very helpful. Um, because you quickly recognize that in Congress you have limited time, maybe five minutes to ask questions. As a chairwoman, I'll have more latitude now. Um, but knowing how to ask the right questions, um, trying to get the right information out um, is all, all going to be very helpful. And then you still have to deal with your colleagues on the other side. Like I see it as opposing counsel on these issues, and we're still having to correct the correct the misleading information being put out there um, is something we're going to have to continue to do. Uh, so I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Speaking of your colleagues on the other side, uh, we are all just reeling with the acquittal, and for someone who was in Washington on January 6th to 
to count those votes and to fortify an election. Can you tell us about what that was like to to be there? And do you have post-traumatic stress disorder now from what you saw and experienced that all of us watched on television? So the fascinating thing about January 6th is we were all warned. And we were told to come early that day uh, to try to stay off the streets. Um, and we all thought that there was going to be plenty of security. There was no way security was going to be breached. Um, on my way into the office, um, a lot more streets were closed off, and we knew something was wrong. And I was actually scheduled to be on the House, in the House chamber at that at 2 p.m. And this happened right around 2.20, 2.25. I was running late. And thank goodness I was running late that day because as I was getting to ready to walk, I was told they had just evacuated one of the nearby buildings and that I should go back to my office. And shortly thereafter, we heard the intercom system, which has never been used, Aaron, before that I ever remember. Uh, a woman came on saying, shelter in place, lock your door, stay away from the windows. Now, kids have drills at schools. We don't have these drills with members. And so this, for me, was completely new. And then when you looked up at the images on um, the news that they had breached security, they were in the Capitol, and all our buildings are connected by tunnels. And so it was the fear starts to set in of are they going to come looking for members. We would hear people in the hallways, and we didn't know if there were the rioters or if they were friendlies. So it was a very – it was just a lot of fear. I feel lucky in the sense I had two members of my staff with me. We barricaded the door, um, and I didn't have the experience of being on the floor when the shot was fired, when members were struggling to put their gas masks on, and they couldn't even get the, the plastic open. Um, but there are many, many members and staff who, you know, we have meetings um, to, to hear people out and to have... Um, health experts uh, tell people it's okay not to feel okay and uh, to try to get through this tough time because the reality is that now members are also afraid of some of the other members, which is a whole a whole different trauma and stress. And, um, you know, you have members of Congress now wearing bulletproof vest, something I never thought I would see or experience in in my time in Congress, not in this country. Mm. I have a, an amazing question from Alexis. She is a, a student at Chapman University, and she's also Jewish. And Alexis asked, how did you feel during the riot at the Capitol when you saw people wearing an Auschwitz camp shirt or other shirts that said six million was not enough in the halls of the Capitol, a place that represents freedom from being oppressed? It's, and think about it now, and it's hard not to break down and cry. It's really hard to think about the hate um, that these people were feeling and that they do feel. You know, we thought that was a chapter passed in this country. And we learned on January 6th, not only are these feelings out there that people have of hate and division. Um, but then to put on a shirt and a sweater like that to come to the Capitol, where we are fighting um, for equality, we are fighting against the discrimination, fighting to make sure something like, like that never happens again, was a real stain on our, on our country. Um, I try to... I tried to think about it and, and say, look, this was a selected few, um, but we can't ignore that, that there is anti-Semitism and that there is discrimination and that there are some people who are harboring um, these negative feelings that are leading to violence, um, which is why it's so important that we call it out when we see it, that we do not tolerate it, because we cannot go down the road of saying this is okay. Um, we need to put an end to it as quickly as possible. 
When you saw the flags uh, that were um, antithetical to everything you believe, whether it was a Confederate flag or um, a white supremacist flag, what did that feel like in a place of of homage where you work every day um, in the rotunda to see those images? Um, how did that make you feel? Well, it was really disrespectful and it desecrated the people's house as something that we as a body um, try day in and day out to um, to disown and to change. Um, so it was very it was very hard to see the images and to not understand why somebody wasn't there to stop them um, and to have these images that will live in history now. And what is that going to tell us about that point in time in our history when we thought that we were moving away from Confederate flags? You know, we're moving away to rename military bases. Um, but this was a, a lot more than that, clearly. You know, the it was the rise of white supremacy again, and it was very hurtful. And then if you didn't see the images, of course, who was cleaning up? The mess afterward. It was janitorial staff, African American, just brought back those those feelings of, you know, the 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 struggle that we've had and that we are still fighting against to get equality in this country. I love the image of your colleague who was pacing, and then he actually went down the rotunda and cleaned up. What, have you had a chance to to see those images of him literally on his hands and knees picking up uh, the shards of, of, of flagpoles that were desecrated or water bottles? But he, as a Congress member, just felt like, I have to do something. So I'm not sure which those images those are. I've seen some of Andy Kim. Yeah, it was Andy Kim. Um, from New Jersey. And it was it was very emotional to see that because— to and to speak to him about it and what he was thinking, what was going through his mind is here he is, um, is a relatively um, newer member in the sense. And when when he came to Congress, I don't think he ever thought he would be cleaning up a mess and a destruction really of of the Capitol. Um, but it was a, a reminder too. It was it was good to see that we're all in this together. And no matter who we are, we're all going to do our part. And picking up the pieces. When you think of PTSD and colleagues who are wearing a bulletproof vest and other colleagues such as AOC who get death threats, what does that feel like when you when you go to work and you're fighting the good fight, or as John Lewis would encourage you, getting into good trouble, that there's this other element of, of fear and danger? Well, you know, death threats are very real, and when you get them, they're they're very scary. We, members of Congress, we don't have a security detail. They don't, we don't get followed into a grocery store, home, have somebody camped out at our house. And that means we are completely vulnerable. I mean, just take a look at Gabby Giffords. And so getting a death threat is very scary and traumatizing that the thing that you're standing up for and fighting for is what's causing people to hate you and then threaten your life. Um, we have seen a number of members, um, they happen to be women, a lot of women of color who are receiving death threats. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking because we should not tolerate it. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you should, we should all stand up against any kind of death threats. Um, when Steve Scalise got shot on the baseball field, we weren't thinking, oh, good, he's a Republican. Oh, he's a Republican. No, it was he was one of us. And that's how we should look at these, is for democracy to work, for it to work right, we cannot, we cannot allow um, that to continue. And we need to stand up and make sure that we're calling it out when it happens. But it's, um, it's heartbreaking when one of your colleagues is, um, is the subject of death threats. Do you, you think it will be possible to have unification uh, in the next 
term um, after an acquittal and after censures and everything that's happening post-January 6th? Well, I think there are uh, factors that are going to make it more challenging, um, especially when you have so many uh, of our colleagues who decided that they were willing to try to overturn this election. So it will be harder, but uh, there are um, some Republicans we can work with. And at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves, what can we get done for the American people? Because this is about the American people. This is about making progress. So in the case this week, we're trying to push, you know, COVID relief bill. And if we can get Republicans on board, then great. And I happen to think, even though they're opposing it now, when it comes down to it, we are going to get Republicans to vote for this because their constituents need help and are in need. And we're hearing that from Republican governors and mayors and elected officials on the ground. And so hopefully that pressure will um, will help our colleagues in Congress do the right thing. Speaking of COVID, I have some wonderful questions from some college students about COVID. Uh, Leslie De La Torre, she's also a student at University of California, Irvine, and she wanted to ask you a question about COVID and schools. She said, since COVID closed down all the schools, and now some schools are starting to reopen, how do you think students who are struggling with inconsistent school schedules, especially smaller children who don't understand what's going on, how will they acclimate to these changes? Well, it's not easy. It's not easy for parents or for students, and um, we need to move as quickly as we can to reopening schools safely, um, trying to make up for that time, the lost time. Um, but we have to also keep in mind that we're trying to keep everybody safe. So, um, you know, having that home structure is helpful to have, but not everybody has it. And we also know there are some students who are, are having a very hard time now because maybe in the own household is where you're having, you know, domestic violence and family issues. It's making it hard for kids. So um, we need to make sure that their services are available uh, for our students, but we're moving as quickly as we can to, to reopen so that, um, you know, they can, they can adjust as much as possible. We also, you know, also have the lack of access and equal access. And we know that kids are um, some kids are being left behind because of the digital divide, um, because of the lack of support in their homes. And so um, it's in our interest to get kids in schools as quickly as possible. This goes along with that question. It's uh, from Fabiola Alejandres, uh, a U- University of California Irvine student. And she's very interested in mental health. So she wanted to know, Congressman Berrigan, mental health is important and should be taken into consideration. Is there a possibility that mental health resources are, are included in the next COVID package? And do you think there'll be funding for resources um, for mental health? Absolutely. Uh, we just had a hearing the other day, and the very issue of mental health services and investing more in mental health um, is critically needed and is included in the American Rescue Plan, which is the next COVID bill. Um, there, suicides are up. Depression is up. Uh, people are struggling and having to isolate, not having social interaction isn't helping the situation either. So um, we recognize that and there is gonna be an investment in mental health in the next bill. Um, And let me say one thing, I'd say it all the time, and that is, you know, mental health doesn't have a lobby on the Hill like other groups do. So we as members need to make sure that we're pushing this issue uh, because mental health impacts everybody. And it's tied to everything, to gun violence, to how we do in school, well, we do in school, and opportunities are, are available to us. And I tell people all the time, we all have mental health issues. The question is, to what degree? It's okay to ask for help. It's okay not to feel okay, but we are investing in the next bill. I appreciate that. This student, he is actually a high school student. He is going to follow in your footsteps. He is the student body president, second year in a row, and he's only a junior. Wow. His family proudly hails from the country of Nepal. And his question was about health care. He said 
you know, he was very lucky that his mom had a good job and they had health care. And with COVID, she lost her job. And as a family, they were terrified during this COVID crisis, what would happen to the family. Um, so his question was really about health care for, for those that are really struggling, especially immigrants or folks who don't have health care tied to their jobs. Can you talk about how you personally fight for health care for all? So this is something I uh, know that the administration is cares deeply about, which is why you've seen the reopening of the enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act, because we want to make sure people who have lost their jobs have the ability to maybe get health care under the Affordable Care Act. Um, that's something that the prior administration didn't advertise, really didn't have a open period or want to keep it open. Uh, but people who have lost their jobs, this is an opportunity for them to go on to the exchange and see if they can get, um, you know, health care under the subsidized system because this is not the time for people to be losing their health care. We also have to make sure that there's uh, options so clinics are available and there's uh, other means for people to get um, access to care. It is it is a very challenging time, but health care is at the top of one of my priorities, and it is as well for this uh, president and administration. Mm. Adrian is a student from UC Irvine, and he is contemplating whether he wants to be a clinical therapist or if he wants to be a social worker. But as a proud Angelino, he has noticed that homelessness is on the rise. And he just wanted to ask you a question. He said, homelessness in the U.S. seems to be a huge issue, especially in major cities like my own, Los Angeles. And with homelessness rates rising immensely, it seems as if we're only providing the bare minimum for the disadvantaged. Congressman Berrigan, what are some possible strategies that can be supported in order to help eliminate the surge of homelessness? And is it possible to eliminate it as a whole? Absolutely. But it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time, and there's not going to be an easy overnight fix on fixing homelessness. Um, number one, we have to in, uh, invest in affordable housing. Uh Housing costs are skyrocketing. People can't afford to pay their rent. COVID now, people are losing their jobs. Um, we can't afford to have, we can't afford to make it worse and have more people um, become homeless. So we need to invest in affordable housing. Um, we need to invest in uh, mental health services and wraparound services for people. You know, many times people think that if you see somebody that's homeless on the street, it's because they want to be there or because. Um, you know, they did something terrible, but that's not usually the situation. If you go in and talk to people, sometimes they're students that are homeless. Um, sometimes somebody had one trip to the emergency room and got left with a huge bill because they didn't have insurance and they got a real setback because of health insurance costs. Health insurance costs should never put you on the street or make you homeless. And that's part of our broken healthcare system. Um, but we have to make sure that we recognize um, the high cost in, in housing, that we need to provide um, mental health services as, as well as wraparound services. We need to take care of our veterans when they come back from overseas. Um, and sometimes maybe have PTSD. And we need to invest more in um, services for, for folks who are struggling with addiction. And instead of putting them in a jail, you are providing the help that they need to get through so that they're not um, going to end up on the street. So there's a lot we can do. A lot of it is tied to mental health. And um, we also need to have jobs. We need to have jobs that provide a living wage. Um, you know, the minimum wage hasn't increased in a very long time. But we should have jobs where you, if you have a job, you can afford have a roof over your head. And that's just not the case still. In a county that is striving to be at $15 an hour for minimum wage in, in California, why are your colleagues ac across the country so resistant to a spike in minimum wage? So we see that a lot more in in the, the like the Midwestern states where the cost of living may be lower, maybe they're paying their folks less money. 
uh, but it's hard in a in a, when you look at the country. You know, California has a high cost of living. New York has a high cost of living. Um, that even fifteen dollars an hour is 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 not going to get you by. And so, um, there is that resistance that you know businesses um, will lead the effort on, and then and then it's it's hard to make that progress. But you know, we are fighting to get the fifteen dollar minimum wage into the next COVID bill, and the House is going to send it to the Senate. The big question will be whether the Senate parliamentarian decides whether it's um, germane or not and keeps it in. So we're, we're going to make that effort. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to invest in people. That's what a minimum wage will do. This next question is from Caden, who's Canadian. And he's a graduate of Waldorf University. And what I love about talking to Caden is he doesn't quite understand our government. And if I was an outsider looking in, I wouldn't understand it either. But he wanted to go backwards to go forwards. He, his father is Aboriginal. Uh, and in Canada, they're trying to make amends with the treatment of the Aboriginal rights with residential schools and, and some of the horrific things that happened um, on the reserves in Canada. So his question to you was, what actions can the people of the United States take to inspire change in resources for economic and cultural growth for the Native American community? Well, the first thing is we have to recognize they were here first and that they were displaced, really, and that we need to do we need to do good. And the federal government is in charge um, and has the jurisdiction over tribes and our Native American people. And so we need to do our part in making sure sometimes it's an issue of they don't have access to enough uh, resources on these tribal lands. I mean, I've gone to visit and you have seen um, the lack of access to health care, the lack of access to running water. Um, in some places, you've got companies coming in and bulldozing over these sacred pieces of land to build a pipeline um, further endangering the water supply. So you know, we have to stand up um, to make sure that they're getting um, the rights they deserve, but also um, really being uh, paid back uh, for what we've taken away. And so I think there are ways in, um, in Congress and some efforts being made um, to recognize uh, certain tribes and in, in lands, uh, making sure that they have um, you know, they have the autonomy over their lands. Um, sometimes we come in and uh, we want to change things up, but that's just not how it was set up to be. There's a lot of work to do, um, but making sure that they have access to some basic um, living um, supplies and necessary things like clean water, clean air, health care, investment in schools, all very important. Since so many of our viewers are students, I want to go back to Nanette Diaz Berrigan in elementary school. Um, before you went to UCLA and before you went to law school and before you were a very successful attorney, what was Nanette like in elementary school? Because I want some kid to watch this today and say, I could be her in 20 years. So what were the traits that you had then? Were you sassy? Were you feisty? Did you did you stand up to the bully then on the playground so that you could stand up to a bully at the bully pulpit? Describe Nanette in elementary school. So I was a big tomboy. I mean, that was my big thing. I was always uh, walking around and being a little bit of a rebel. You know, when you're the daughter of immigrants, my, my mom would always say, oh, we don't ask questions. Like, we don't fight back. And I was the one that said, no, mom, we have rights and we got to fight back. And that was early on in elementary school. And I think that was part of me witnessing what would happen to my parents when they went in to inquire about social services or, you know, their immigration status and moving citizenship along. And then I saw my parents disrespected because they were immigrants. So for me as a kid, it was just trying to learn as much as I could so that I could help stand up for my family one day. And, um, you know, I 
I wouldn't say I was like a, a, a study, like a, a, like a nerd or anything like that. Quite opposite. I was always playing athletics on the field. And, you know, when I got to eighth grade, I wasn't doing very well in, in school. As a matter of fact, I had a 1.8 GPA. And so I tell kids all the time, you might be going through a tough period right now, but you can turn it around. I did. And so, um, but I always asked a lot of questions. I was always very interested in learning um, from the days of the Civil War, um, what we did wrong and where we could do better in the civil rights period, because I'm a firm believer that that struggle is something that I experienced in my uh, Latino heritage, is discrimination, that you look different, that didn't feel we were being treated the same. And so... Uh, for me, it was a matter of, um, as a kid, just trying to stand up for my parents and our family. And I think that just carried over into to law school. And, and now, as a member of Congress, standing up for maybe those who are afraid to or those who can't or those who are working two jobs. People tell me, that's why I elected you, so you could go fight for me. Um, so it's... it's um, it's interesting to look back. One of my last questions is for those high school students. You're first generation, and you had to apply to college. I know you, you went to UCLA. But what was that like, that process of, of daring to dream and dream big, that I will be the first? I will be the first to carry this family on a new trajectory. Well, it was really scary because my parents didn't know anything about applying to college. And I just remember when I looked into it, I got a one page document for UCs. And I just remember the advisor saying, all you have to do is click, check three schools that you want to apply to for free. And I remember my mom saying, I don't know how you're going to pay for it, but you got to go to college. And so I had to figure it out on my own and that was as a kid very scary I had to apply for loans with my parents names because I there was no way to do it otherwise they would say well you need a parent loan and I would go to my parents and I'd say well you need a parent loan and they said well whatever you need go ahead and just do it but they didn't know how to fill an application my father had zero income and they said well that's okay he can still apply and so I really had a very limited um, understanding of what it took to get into college and how to even apply, how to navigate the system. So we try in our office to tell families and kids, if you need help with the FAFSA form, with federal aid, um, call us, let us know. But we need to increase the amount of aid and grants we provide because college should not leave you settled with that. And that is one thing that I remember going in, understanding that I was gonna have to come out with debt. Um, but it, it really is a disservice to our students. Because we heard, I hear kids all the time saying, I can't go to afford to go to college. I said, you can't afford not to go to college. But we do have to make sure um, that it's affordable. And frankly, I think, you know, you shouldn't have to pay. Um, at a minimum, community college should be free and something we should move toward. But um, I still look back and I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that I, I navigated the system. Speaking of the system, this is for parents and for teachers. We all watched on January 6th. And what would you like us to tell children and students who are confused and scared about what happened in our country? What, what are some lessons that we could take away from a congressperson who was there, who every single day is going to show up and stand up and speak up and speak out against injustice. What can we say on your behalf? Oh, I think we got to tell kids that what happened that day was a stain on our history, but that we are going to come out stronger. And that is going to take us to stand up for democracy and we need to stand up to hate. And we need to do the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing is hard to do, um, especially in politics. But we need to put our country and the American people ahead of any one person and any hate. 
and that this is a work in progress and that we are going to continue that work and that we need them, our young people, to strive to be at the table and to be those representatives and to be those leaders that are not only going to show the example, but that are going to help us eliminate the hate, um, the discrimination, and uh, hopefully one day to move beyond what we saw happening on the 6th. Um, but it's, it's going to take a lot of work, and we have to, right, have to have the right people there and at the table. Nanette diaz Barragon really inspired me to look at all those that we humbly serve, first-generation high school graduates and first-generation college students, just like the Congresswoman. So this year, we're humbly asking any of you who have it on your heart to help, help us send students to college. We have been giving college scholarships since 1998, when the Freedom Riders graduated. As the Congresswoman described, folks come to her office and learn how to fill out FAFSA forms for financial aid, or the ins and out of just going to college when you were the first to do so. We here at the Freedom Riders Foundation are committed to just that. For over 20 years, we've been giving college scholarships to first-generation high school graduates and first-generation college students. So with your help, we will continue to send amazing students who have dreams, aspirations, and may just someday be sitting in Congress beside Congresswoman Diaz Bergen. For over 20 years, the Freedom Riders Foundation has been honoring the legacy of the original Freedom Riders by providing college scholarships to first-generation high school students who have demonstrated remarkable academic promise despite considerable odds. It feels like a gift to be able to give that gift to someone else. When I sit back and I watch these kids, I'm so thankful to pass that along to someone else. In 2019, we had our first opportunity to pay it forward to the second generation of Freedom Riders. We've known them since birth, and so they've grown up in an environment that was celebrating education. One of our recipients, we started calling him the doctor when he was in middle school to give him a scholarship and to know that he indeed can blaze a new trail and to pay homage not only to his mother, who's a Freedom Rider, but to grandparents who came to this country in pursuit of a dream, to be that American dream. And the doctor is that dream personified. We need your help. Our Freedom Rider scholars embody the mission of our foundation. They teach us each and every day that access to education is the great equalizer for all. Join the movement and support education today. Aaron Gruel and the Freedom Riders created the Freedom Riders Foundation to provide educators with tools to empower all students to succeed. I felt it was really important for us to continue evolving and continue creating curriculum that went to where a student was at. When the pandemic hit, we knew intuitively that quick transition from in-class instruction to online learning would be difficult for a lot of educators and students. We created a 12-week curriculum that really looked at mental health parity in our classrooms. Showing those videos to my kids helped them to see that they're not alone in this world. It's something that can be used with any person of any age just knowing that everybody on that screen was there to make sure kids didn't miss out. Please consider making a donation to the Freedom Writers Foundation so that we can continue to make heartfelt curricula to address students' social emotional needs. So, uh, Tansi, how do you think it went? I just had to be a fly on the wall. It's like you took the words out of my spirit and out of my mouth. You you opened it up to the process of being who you are today because it's not one of, it's not things that, some things happen to us, some things happen with us, some things happen against us and you you did a great job of, of doing it. And I'm glad she, I seem like she knew to pick you. Like I've met you before and being in that space and seeing you um, communicate today, you just delivered a message to a community that really need to hear that. What do you think your peers 
to God. Because, you know, trying to see your Freedom Rider uh, teacher. So you're part of the Freedom Rider family. So they're not necessarily inside our Freedom Rider bubble. Um, what do you think they took? Everybody is, we're in a space where we have this alternative population where your words were meant to be spread because sometimes when we say things, it's either shunned or misdirected. They're like, oh, that, that's just that program over there. So embodying that excellence, they were got a, they got an opportunity and they understand that uh, that the work we're, we're doing is about enriching the kids' relationships and building that trust with them that they can't fail forward. So you're talking to the right people when we got you on that platform because for years, the school district wanted to do something like this or uh, they, they saw opportunity, but you could never get a teacher to have a conversation. We just opened the door for a teacher to be great. So that's, that's what it was for us. How do you think um, the kids are responding? They were, in the, they were in my inbox. Former students I had, when they saw the Freedom Riders, they were in my inbox like, look, Mr. Williams, remember we used to watch the movie? One little girl sent me, she's in 11th grade now, she sent me a text. I had her in sixth grade from five years ago. She said, I still got this picture on my wall and it's all of us trying to imitate you all. Yeah. So they were there, they were there. The kids, cool. were, the kids were there, the students were there. I, you and I got so much in common. Uh, like I said, I, I do career development with my kids too. And you know, a lot of the things that you're talking about are a lot of things that I'm seeing. So um, I, it was it was refreshing to talk to somebody who has to deal with some of the same things that I have to deal with. That's clear across um, town or clear across the country. Um, you know, it just reminds us that we're all in this together. You know, there's a as many kids as there are out there that have my story. I think there's as many men out there that have our story, that have, have come um, over the horizon and, and gotten to be a better person. And I think um, our next movement is Freedom Riders is to find those people and uh, shed some light on them and get them involved. All right, appreciate you too, brother. Phone, fighting a good fight. In the, in the number of students who are suspended from their class. We've seen a reduction in the number of students who are expelled. We've seen an increase in our students coming to school. And we've seen an increase in uh, students who were chronically absent not being absent so much. And I think all that has factors because teachers are more engaged and they feel more connected and students feel more connected. And for a district this size, 33,000 students, it's hard to be connected. But this has connected us, and uh, you know, that's, that's an impact, you know, being connected about something. On this campus, we're in a unique situation to where several of my teachers have uh, experienced the Freedom Riders Foundation, including myself. Um, these days, we have so many students that have such traumatic backgrounds that it's difficult for them, and um, it's difficult for us to see as adults. Um, and. Prior to, it was almost a feeling of helplessness, but now we know that there's strategies out there that we can actually help these students and help them succeed and um, help give them hope that they will succeed and a chance to succeed. When you're, you know, when you're thinking of where to give or what to give to, I think you should think of this foundation, the Freedom Riders Foundation, because what it, what it gives to education in our community is something that they don't get in a credential program or they don't get in you know, their education through, through college. And it's something that they vitally need teachers do. And we have a shortage of teachers in the profession. And we want people to stay, we want them to remain. And we know they're good people. They need tools, they need support. And through the Freedom Riders Foundation, teachers get that support. And it makes them a much better educator and it makes our community much better.
I look for these stories from storytellers to help teachers um, and those they humbly serve try to make sense out of things that don't make sense. Try to allow people to know that sometimes it's okay to not be okay. And as a teacher, when I learned of the horrific hate crime that was bestowed on Matthew Shepard, I never expected to meet the parents. Judy and Dennis Shepard have become advocates and activists and political pundits where they pack a punch trying to change the laws of our country, if not the world, to allow people to have a place in society, to love how they want to love, to live how they want to live. And so meeting Judy and Dennis Shepard was one of those pinch me moments. So to be able to introduce our incredible audience to someone who is on the, the cutting edge of making things better for humanity is such a gift and such an honor and so humbling. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce all of you to someone who may be short in stature, but is a giant that we can all stand on her shoulders. And that would be Judy Shepard. Thank you for joining us, Judy. Gosh, Aaron, I hope I can live up to that delightful, delightfully humbling introduction. Thank you. You're welcome. And I, and I mean that and more. I think every time I've, I've been in your presence, whether it was in an audience where you're on a stage or in a movie theater when your, your incredible films about your son have been showed to the world, um, watching on my television when you've done you know political events, I just weep. So I, I have a feeling that our audience may do the same today. And I, and I hope they do. So what is it like to be an ordinary person who has commanded an extraordinary stage? And that stage is global. Well, I, to be honest, I can't think of it in those terms. Um, I'm, I am an ordinary person given extraordinary opportunity that I would get back in a heartbeat to have Matt back. But this is, a, this is something that just happened to us that we didn't seek out. Um, I don't think it's changed us other than made us more aware of the things around us and that we have a voice. But in all reality, we all have that voice. Mm. It's just who's given the opportunity to use it. We can all use it whenever we want, but we've been handed a larger opportunity, I guess. And we're doing it for Matt and his friends and you know his community, um, thinking maybe we could change some hearts and minds. When Matt passed 20 plus years ago, we sure didn't think we'd still be that voice now, 20 years later. People have a tendency to move on, right? So the fact that Matt's story has hung on um, is still a touchstone and unfortunately is still relevant is uh, at the same time heartbreaking, infuriating, frustrating, um, but it gives us the opportunity to talk about Matt all the time, which is lovely. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in the Freedom Rider world, we there's icons that I, I found that we could talk about an Anne Frank and it would really lead to humanity. Um, talking about a Matthew Shepard leads to humanity. So for our younger audience who may be exposed to the story for the first time and listening to you or watching you is going to want them to read and listen and learn more. Um, tell us about your beautiful son, Matt, prior to this tragedy, before you had that stage and that extraordinary opportunity to recount his life. Let's go back to when he was just a beautiful boy growing up in Wyoming, where you are today. Right. So Matt was um, small in stature. He was 5'2 and weighed 110 on a good day. Um, he smoked too much. He drank too much coffee. He was a college student uh, when he was when we lost him. Twenty one. Um, I would not have wanted my life at twenty one to be memorialized forever. He's never been given the chance to grow into who he could have become. He loved the theater. Uh, he loved to debate. Um, he was a great talker. Everything new was amazing to Matt. He under, did not understand 
at all the tendency that people have to categorize other people or stereotype other people. To Matt, people were just people. Um, perfectly typical, equal, nothing about them other than their uniqueness made them different to Matt. He just saw another person struggling to live their life um, on a day-to-day -day basis to feel safe and loved and, um, you know, contribute. That was his whole goal. Uh, even at a very young age, he was obviously, he was very empathetic. My mother even commented when he was four years old that the empathy he showed for other people was beyond her understanding. Mm. Now, my mother was not particularly empathetic. Just throw that out there. Um, but she did recognize it in uh, other people. I think maybe because it was unusual to her. I'm, I'm not sure. She grew up in a different time. Women had a different place in her time. So, uh, you know, it was a new world to her. But Matt did have the opportunity to come out to her, um, which I was very worried about because she was a bit of a bigot, and uh, which I've talked about frequently. But she was, she was okay with it. You know, she was like, she said to me afterwards, I don't understand why people think that being gay is like wrong. I don't, I don't understand. It's just a person. And then later I said, so mom, can Matt bring his boyfriend over? She goes, no, no, no. Meeting Matt was fine. That was enough. But it, Matt's Matt. And I don't really need to meet anymore. That, that was beyond her, um, her capability. Uh, yeah. So Matt was all about social change, justice, equality, the environment. All the things that we're, you know, young people are dealing with today was his avenue. Um, he never met anybody that was not a, that was a stranger. Um, he felt like he knew them immediately. He just loved he just loved people. Um, every mother says their smile could light up a room. Well, that that was true with Matt, but his whole body smiled. It was it was just like a puppy kind of you know thing. You just knew he was excited and happy to see you were be there or um, he couldn't hide his emotions very well. He did go through times of being unsure of himself, a, a depression. Not sure, I'm not sure what to call it really, um, but there were times when he was not quite sure of himself, who he was. He struggled with that. Uh, I don't know how long he struggled with being gay and not wanting to talk about it because he didn't come out to us until he was 18. Not sure he'd made up his mind or if he just wasn't ready or, you know, I don't know. I don't know that. We'll never know that, really. We never will. You know, what I loved about meeting Michelle, who made that Emmy Award winning documentary about your son's life. Matthew Shepard is a friend of mine. What I loved about Michelle and the cast of characters that she was able to gather that were his friends it, it, it showed a part of his life that a lot of people don't know about, about him going to school in Switzerland, about you as a family moving to Saudi Arabia for a moment in time. And, and some of the things that you just talked about, his smile, um, smiling from his whole being. So for the, for the young folks who don't know that he had this rich life in, in other continents and other countries, what was that like for a young boy from Wyoming? to find himself in Saudi Arabia and Switzerland and, and to travel the world with this really unique school that he had the opportunity to go to in high school? Well, we purposely went to Saudi thinking that this would be an opportunity for both our boys to expand their horizon, to know that life existed outside their backyard in Wyoming. Um, Logan was only 12, so this was not an opportunity he was looking forward to, but Matt definitely was. And he tried to explain to people that going to boarding school was a plus, not a negative in one's life. Um, when we dropped him off at Switzerland, it was a very old um, building. And I remember looking, him looking at me like, are you really going to leave me here with <laughs> nobody that I know and nothing that is familiar? That lasted about a week, you know, until he got to know what was expected of him. He loved every minute of it. Um, the travel was expansive. However, there was this one thing about Matt that if anything was going to go wrong on a trip, it was going to happen to Matt. Lose his passport, suitcase get lost, suitcase break, backpack stolen, anything go wrong, it would happen to Matt. Um, his friends, they were great at taking care of him uh, and getting him through those trying times. 
Um, but his his whole world expanded on meeting other students from around the world. Um, he was a little bit challenged financially because he was a, a, a the company sent him to school, not us, right? So everybody else was there on their parents' dime, and so they had money to spend. He did not have that kind of money to spend, which was a little bit uh, dismaying for him um, to not feel like I'm equal footing with them. Maybe that led to some Delft up too. I don't know. I know it was an issue uh, in his head. Anyway. I'm glad you said that because I, I found that with the Freedom Riders when they were afforded these amazing opportunities to go off to college. Uh, a lot of them got scholarships and they find themselves in a, in a college in Massachusetts and everyone's going to go to the Cape for the weekend or the Hamptons. And my students couldn't even afford to call home. You know, so th it's hard when you are not running with the fast crowd with the resources. So for the, those that don't know, the, the company that your husband worked for was in the oil industry. And, and how did, was that connected to what he was doing in Wyoming prior to you leaving? Right. Uh, Dennis is a safety engineer for a drilling oil drilling company uh, and was uh, recruited to go to Saudi Arabia to work for Saudi Aramco and uh, the largest oil company in the world, actually. And we lived on a compound in Saudi, 16,000 other folks. It was like a piece of Southern California set down in the Saudi Arabia mm. um, in the eastern province on the Persian Gulf. So it was not totally un-American to live there. Everything was very familiar. Um, but the company, so many employees were from the, West, from the Western world that students didn't really want young people to bring their ideas to their own culture, right? So they sent students outside of the country to any boarding school in the world that they wanted to go to, uh, okay. all the Western students. So Matt chose to go to uh, Switzerland. Our other son chose to go to Minnesota because he was tired of living overseas. So, you know, they were completely different um, in their outlook on life. And it was fun to talk to stories uh, about that. But Matt loved living in Europe. There was just something very unique about it um, that he never would have gotten to experience otherwise. You know, I'm interested because I know you've traveled the world extensively and, and I have as well. And, and some of the countries I've gone to in the Middle East are not as inclusive to the LGBTQIA community. I remember I did an event in Dubai and I deliberately took uh, a rainbow flag with me. And someone said that could, that could be really um, controversial and taboo and political in Dubai, but we were supposed to make this beautiful collage when we got there and I wanted it to be part of my collage. My assumption is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the Saudi government would not have would not have embraced Matthew if he had come out to you while he was on the compound. And do you think that might have had something to do with him not coming out till much later at 18 because of the climate and the lack of inclusivity? Well, you're you're correct. Saudi is even much more um, strict on that point than some of the other Middle Eastern countries. I have a feeling Dubai wouldn't have been as challenging as Saudi. Um, but Matt only lived in Saudi one summer, okay. uh, the first summer before school started. So the influence of the government there would not have, would not have, in, in all honesty, would not have played a, biggest, a bigger role in his decision than the televangelists in the U.S. during the same time period, who were on TV all the time telling folks how bad it was to be gay and we should all put them on an island and, or stone them or whatever. I mean, it was, their, their rhetoric was just as harmful as anything he would have heard uh, in Saudi. In fact, in Saudi, it wasn't even discussed, um, but it also wasn't something they watched for unless someone was soliciting, you know, on the street. It wouldn't, it, they weren't looking for it to happen. It's just part of their cultural rhetoric and, and still is. As he, he's beautiful. And I'm, I'm gonna refer to him as an is. I, I'm an English teacher and I, I think tenses are really important. So I feel like in everything that you do, uh, Matthew was very present and very intentional. So we're, I'm, I'm going to use is as much as I can rather than was, because I know you, you feel him at every moment of every day. When, when Matthew was a child, and although he did not come out until he was 18, was there 
a mother, a motherly intuition that he was gay and that you were just waiting for him to come to you so that you could be accepting? Um, was there any feeling that you had or signs that you experienced that that you were okay with it and just waiting for that that moment to unfold? Well, that's exactly what it was like, Aaron. He he was. I can't even, I can't put words to it. It was mother's instinct totally. I had many gay friends in college. Um, it was going to be fine with me, but I also knew Matt. I knew that if I approached him about it, he would retreat. He would not have been receptive to that at all. It had to be his, he had to be ready and he had to be ready to talk about it and be ready to defend it, I guess. Uh, we made it very clear that he, it would never be an unwelcoming home. Um, I talked about the gay community in a very positive way, as much as it was a, as much as it was a thing in the '90s, because it it wasn't even really a topic discussion in the '90s, right? It, it was still very much a secret secret society, uh, other than the AIDS pandemic and the occasional news article about pride parades. It was not it was just not a topic of discussion. But I made it clear that it was that I did not think it was a bad thing or, you know, that I would be accepting no matter what, that we all, the family would be. Mm. Um, and I love that it's very much a family. And I think what I love about your, your family is that although there's a stereotype or a perception about a cowboy, which Dennis clearly is, um, there's this tenderness of your husband that melts me. And I, I love that in this world of oil and cowboys and and the west that there's this father figure who was so inviting and open and i just think that says a lot about you as a wife to pick someone like that to be your life partner who would be as open as you are yeah well i'm not sure that i actually knew that when i when we were married um and i'm i have to be honest with you i'm not sure i would have known that even through our life until what happened to Matt. He was accepting of Matt, of course he was. Matt's our son, that was never gonna be a question. But when Matt passed and Dennis saw how other young people in particular, well, not even Matt, anybody in the gay community who had faced rejection, it just broke his heart. He was just crushed that that would be a deciding factor in anyone's respect or love for anyone else. And um, I think it opened him up even more to, um, to the idea that not everyone is like him, that there are those out there who, who pick up on differences and amplify them in a negative way. He, he's never been like that. It's always been about taking care of other people um, who, who might need help. That's, that's the way he was raised and, and that's the way he lived his life. But when it happened in his family, it became a bigger deal. There's a scene in the documentary about the night that Dennis goes back to get the teddy bear, oh, the rabbit, and it's and, and and bring it to the hospital. And that's that's what I think about is the quintessential Dennis moment of of in that like mania, that that tenderness. I just I love that using that word specifically for men when when they are like Dennis. But talk about that 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 loving, gentle side. For for a young boy who who was on his deathbed, seeing your husband step up, not just in a hospital, but to the world that was watching, because what happened to your son became a global phenomenon. And for the young people that that were that are not familiar with the story, they won't understand what you had to face as parents when you walked outside of a hospital, when you left your home, when it was the Kardashian moment before there was Kardashians, that you, you, the phenomenon that you faced was unprecedented. Well, yeah, it was. And we weren't, we weren't expecting it when we, um, we didn't really know what happened to Matt when we left Saudi, when we got the word that he'd been found and was unconscious and not expected to survive. So when we found out that all the press was gathering, it was a totally foreign thing to us, but it was also secondary. We just had to get there to be with Matt. And when we got to the hospital, his physicians were like, we know you're scared. We know you're upset, 
But when you go into Matt's room, please try to remain positive and calm. Mm. Don't show your fear or your anger because we know that those emotions will may translate to Matt, even though he's unconscious. So we made every effort to make it feel comfortable for him. Played his music, familiar smells, scents, my, my perfume he bought for me, um, stories. And Dennis just felt that, that his rabbit, Oscar, would be the one thing that, that would make it better. We all felt so helpless, right, that we, we just had to do something, right? So, um, so Dennis drove five hours home, tore the storage unit apart looking for the rabbit and didn't find it. Um, but he found other things that he felt would be comforting to Matt. <sighs> so, um, but it was just this sense of, I have to do something, right? I can't just watch um, that overtook Dennis. And he was so angry um, at the senselessness of it all. <sighs> and we just had to figure out how to not communicate that to Matt. There were actually a lot of family and friends that came to be with us while Matt was still uh, in the hospital. And of course, we let them go visit him, right? It was about him, not us. So that helped us and them and Matt, I think, I hope. Mm. When you started putting the pieces together of, of what exactly did happen and and knowing that the perpetrators didn't have parents like you and Dennis, didn't have um, these beautiful, loving hearts. And, and as you learned the details, um, can you share what that was like with our audience as a mother when you're, when you're hearing the recap of your, your son's final hours and days on this planet um, and how horrific it actually was? Well, yeah, it was... It was really confusing. I've never understood that level of hate or uh, I just, I don't understand it, that they would feel that much anger and hate towards something that they they didn't understand, that they feared even. I have to think of it that way. I do think of it that way. I think that's what it is. It's a fear of something you don't understand. And so it creates this anger and sometimes leads to violence. If those two boys and their bullying when they were young especially the Aaron McKinney, if that had been addressed when he was a young man, he might have been a totally different person, but it was not. Bullies are bullies for a reason. We need to address that reason or things that would happen to Matt will continue to happen. Um, zero tolerance in schools just doesn't work. But when we found out the families they came from, it, broke, it was like, this just can't. They came from broken homes. Many people come from broken homes and are wonderfully successful and loving and kind people. But these two young men had a childhood that was terrible. It was awful. And one was from a bad home and the other lost his mom at a very young age. And he just went wild. And no one, you know, what to do about him is like, that does not give you the right to do what you did to my son. Uh, and for the reasons that you did it, that makes no sense to me. And then when the trials were over and we knew that um, Aaron was facing the death penalty, his defense team approached us and said, do you, is this, would you consider the same sentencing for him as the other young man who had pled guilty uh, if we remove all appeals? And I said, I have to talk it over with everybody else. I wanted to do it because I wanted it to be over. But I also understood that this isn't going to solve anything, right? Isn't even though we'd had this discussion when James Burr Jr. was murdered, that sometimes the death penalty feels like the answer. This was not the time. And I didn't also thought Matt would agree with us that this was not the time. It felt too personal, I guess. Um, but they they were they'll never get out of prison unless the governor of Wyoming commutes a sentence, then they're eligible for parole. I don't see that happening in my lifetime. But the reason I wanted to go for the deal was I didn't want our other son, Logan, to deal with constant appeals, mandatory appeals to the death penalty. Mm. And there's always the option, right, that some technicality is going to play an absurdly large role. And I didn't want that option either. So um, and anyone who thinks it was merciful to remove the death penalty 
doesn't really think about what it feels like for a 20 year old to be in prison for two lifetimes, right? This is not mercy, um, but it is over. We don't ever have to deal with them again. So that part is good, but we've lost our beautiful son and their families lost their sons. And it wasn't just our life that was altered forever, but theirs as well and their friends and their family members. It was, it was a tragedy all around, a totally senseless tragedy all around. Mm. What has it been like for you as, as the story has unfolded? Um, there's documentaries and films, um, an exquisite play that a lot of high schools use, uh, the Laramie Project. What is that like for you to, to sit in? I've, I've been in the same theater when we watched the documentary and it won awards. Or what is it like for you to have that story come back to life? And it's not entertainment, it's more information and a, and a call to action. But what is that like for you as a parent to, to see those stories come back to life? Well, the, the documentary is particularly hard because there he is in front of you, alive and well and happy. And then in the end, he's gone again. It's, we can't watch it. We just, you just can't do it. I mean, we've done it a dozen times, I'm sure, but it just gets harder and harder every time I keep thinking I'm I'm okay with this I can I can deal with this I can't I really can't let me project I saw it the first time all the way through 10 years later I couldn't I just couldn't do it um there's a now a thing called considering Matthew Shepard it's an oratorial same thing it tells the story of Matt and this beautiful music I just I can't I just can't do it um it's just real I can talk about Matt till Everybody wishes I would stop, but to actually visualize it is really hard, really hard. I'm thrilled that those things are out there. So people get to know Matt in a different way than reading about him as a young person who was murdered because he was gay. They see him as a three-dimensional human being um, with friends and family who cared about him and loved him. But it's really hard for us to watch. Mm -hmm. It must be the, the the stark images. I you know I think of when I when I've taught this story is always the fence in in Wyoming. Yeah. And and have you and Dennis gone to that fence? Was that was that something that you needed to see firsthand, or is it just through photographs? And for our young authors and 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 watchers who don't know about the fence, can you talk about how that played such an important role in this hate crime? Well, it's a, it's a buck rail fence, which picture the fences that we all just talked about, Abe Lincoln building, was that kind of fence. Um, it's used on in ranches and, and particularly among areas where there's a lot of uh, game hunting. And they had the two young men had tied Matt to the bottom of this fence um, as they beat him and tied his hands to the bottom pole uh, as he was sitting on the ground. Tied up, they were beating him. That's that's cool. So um, the one image that was totally wrong about that fence is that there was a, a editorial cartoon. Oh, the sun just came out. Ah. There was an editorial cartoon. Well, I hate to call it a cartoon illustration of Matt tied to this fence in the crucifixion pose. And that is not what it was like. It was not like that at all. He was tied to the bottom of the fence on the ground. But that is the one thing that I cannot convince people was not true. Maybe in their mind they need it to be, maybe that's how they picture it, I, I don't know. Um, but to go to the fence, Dennis went to see it, but I did not. I knew Matt was not there. I didn't need to see it to know what happened and to feel the anguish, um, but Dennis did feel the need to go. Before the trials had even started, that piece of property was sold and the fence was dismantled. You can't even go near it now. There is a no trespassing sign strung across the dirt road that leads to it. The new owner did not want it to become a uh, memorial site. So you, you, can't, you can't find it there anymore unless you know someone in Laramie who knew where it was. Uh, that's fine with me. I don't, I don't particularly feel safe Sending people who want to mourn Matt to Laramie, Wyoming. I don't feel safe doing that, or Wyoming in general. Um, 
there is a memorial bench on the University of Wyoming campus in Laramie um, in a very well lit, secure place. And it took a long time for me even to for me to even to agree to do that because I was so worried about vandalism. Mm. That would have been like murdering that all over again. But it is in a safe and secure place, and they're always finding flowers and notes there. So it was a good thing. Uh, as as an, an accidental on purpose activist, I can only imagine when you when you said murdering Matt again, I can only imagine folks who've taken out their ire and their hate and, and directed towards you and your husband who are so loving. And, and what is that like having been on the other end with the Freedom Riders when we've received death threats and when we've received hate mail? Um, it's devastating. What is that like for you to have been a recipient of that kind of hatred? Oh, it's just nonsense. It's just nonsense. I, I couldn't take any of that personally. I knew it was their own hatred trying to identify itself and garner attention. The Westboro Baptist Church was like the worst of them all, just filled with hate. I knew I was right and they were wrong. I, I wasn't going to give them any power. And I just, I ignored them all. I know it's still out there. We still get hate mail and calls occasionally at the office in Denver, but it's just, we all know it's, it's weak. It's, uh, motivated by hate and not and not at all I never feared for my own personal safety I know it was a concern at some colleges when I would speak but is this is it no that I just didn't give it any power did it hurt me no I felt bad for them that their lives were so enveloped in hate that they would never know the joy of love the way I did so it's their loss as as a parent when you when you when you evoke the Westboro Baptist Church, which has been very iconic. Um, they're at every pride parade I've ever attended um, with their megaphones and their signs. And children, oh, I hate when I see them having children with their handmade signs. So as, as a loving mother who experienced joy and love, what is that like when you've been at these protests and you see these kids who are being taught to hate where you taught Matt to love? Well, they're following a very narrow ideology, right? They think that their God hates everything. That's It's a very, uh, in my view, their view of God is a very demeaning, demanding, cruel God. And that is not at all what I was brought up to believe. I didn't come from a religious family, but I learned that from my friends and, and my parents. That, that is not what any of us thought what that was about. And I felt just terrible grief and pain for the loss those kids were experiencing but they didn't know that they weren't experiencing love and their household that's how they experienced love was to share this story of how much god hates pretty much everything as near as i could tell i know there have been family members who have left and when fred phelps passed a few years ago the whole organization sort of splintered off into different things they didn't agree but they didn't know until they left what they what they were missing. In my view, they were learning something completely different. Um, I feel bad for them. I think that they've been denied their childhood. Uh, they how can anyone else relate to that childhood? Right? It's it's just beyond me how that how that happens. I I've never understood the anger. And as I said earlier, I I just I just don't get it. I don't I don't get any of that. And when I was talking about my mom being a bigot, I made a very conscious decision at the age of eight that that was not going to be my life. That uh, I didn't I didn't understand it even then. But she learned it from her parents and so on and so on. And that's where this hate and prejudice comes from. It is taught from generation to generation. And you just it's choice. That's really the only thing here that is a choice. You know, I'm glad you're saying that because so many of our listeners are youthful and i love that you know at age eight you made a conscious choice i'm not going to be a bigot i'm not going to be prejudiced and i would hope that some of our listeners could do the same L listening to you as a mother's love and realize i have my own volition my own choices to make and i don't have to espouse the stuff that my parents espouse which leads me to your activism you you mentioned earlier james burt jr and for for the young folk who don't know who James Byrd Jr. was, it was around the time that your son was, was murdered. James Byrd was tied to a pickup truck 
in Texas and, and dragged behind a car, an African-American. And what you were able to do with James Bird Jr.'s family sparked a revolution. So can you tell our listeners what you did that was just amazing as parents who were hurting and wanting to heal, but wanting this to stop? Well, there was, in the civil rights uh, movement in the 60s, 1960s, I find it weird to have to call it the 1960s. Um, there was a hate crime law that was introduced that covered race, religion, and national origin. It was it was very narrow. It had to had occur during a protected uh, uh, event like voting or going to school. That hate crimes. That's how hate crimes were de um, defined. However, when James Burr Jr. was murdered in Texas, he was murdered on a public road. So existing hate crime laws, federal laws, did not cover his crime. Mm. And Texas had no hate crime laws then. And when Matt was murdered, the federal hate crime law did not cover sexual orientation. Uh, and Wyoming, and which Wyoming still doesn't have, is a hate crime law at all. So when Matt was killed um, and James Byrd was killed, there was added to an already movement that was happening to expand federal hate crime laws. The main of the bills had been introduced and so forth, even before those two events happened. But there was trouble getting it through Congress because they wanted to include the LGBT community. And Congress was like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, luckily, the, the writers of the bill were um, not going to take out the gay community because the FBI had already been, you know, had they already had the numbers they, that had been authorized by Congress. So they knew hate crimes were being committed against the gay community. So I joined with other uh, organization leaders to speak before Congress, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, they lobbied. I was a terrible lobbyist because I had no patience. Um, I just, I thought y'all went there to do the right thing and you're not doing the right thing. So uh, I had no patience for them. I could talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, but not when they were with their people. Um, I got to know Speaker Nancy Pelosi pretty well in those years. Um, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a thing. In the Clinton administration, when I joined, um, he, he did what he sometimes does, which is give it a lot of lip service and then not really accomplish much. Bush administration, George W., we knew he was not ever going to sign anything that would advance the gay community. As governor of Texas, we'd, we'd already seen that. He said he would not sign any hate crime legislation um, that included the gay community because he just didn't think, you know, they were real. He, it was a choice to him, I guess. But when Obama was elected, we all felt, all us quote unquote social justice warriors felt that we have the man in the office now who could really help us accomplish these things, these necessary humanitarian things. And in 2009, October 2009, Obama signed into law the federal hate crime bill that now covers gender identity and expression, the gay community, disability, gender, um, expands the parameters of when a hate crime can be committed, it doesn't fix everything because it doesn't require reporting, which is absolutely necessary for law enforcement to tell us where these things are happening um, to be able to address the issue. But just recently, I will add that there was, an, there was an additional hate crime law passed to address the hate crimes um, being committed against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that now requires reporting in certain cases, which is better than what it was before, but also provides money for training uh, for law enforcement. So, you know, we're in a better place than we were last year uh, in so many ways. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I lobbied. Well, I didn't lobby. I was present. I was a presence. You were a force um, to be reckoned with. I was a force yeah. to be reckoned with. You're right. I couldn't go office to office and talk to them because they just lied to me. So I had a I had an alliance with Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts and Senator Smith from Oregon, a Republican Mormon um, who was with the gay community in every aspect because he regarded it as a human right. He said he would never be with us with marriage, which I understood as a Mormon, but the rest of it was, to him, it was a human right. It was for the country. It was for the betterment of 
U.S. citizens. Where did we lose that knowledge? Where did we lose that figure of speech that it was like for all Americans, not my party, right? Where did that go? I got off track a little bit there. Oh, I love this. You know, what I do love also, I'm, I am on your newsletters and I, as a foundation, what Matthew Shepard does for the world is it, it keeps people accountable. So whenever there's something wrong, and politically, there was a lot of things that were wrong with the last administration. Yes. Your foundation was vigilant. You gave data and statistics and numbers. Um, and you really come out to fight for the trans community, which I think is so exquisite when young people were being denied just simple things of going to the bathroom at schools and, and, and equity. So as this foundation has grown and now that Logan is older and, and a part of this foundation, the whole family, what is it like to be on the forefront of being on the right side of history? Well, it's glorious to see that the rest of the country wants to be on the right side of history too. Well, I can't even say that, that the bulk of the country wants to be on the right side of history too. I think there are far more of us who want to see that. It's just that we're not quite as loud. And we need to be loud. We all have a voice. We all should be using it. And please vote. Y'all need to vote. Be an educated voter. I say that till I can't say it anymore. Um, it's really important that we pay attention to what's going on. And the fact that the trans community finally has a language to describe who they are and what they are, that the rest of us can try to understand, that we can try to be involved in their progression towards equality is really important to me. When I first started this, the language that was inherent to the trans community just didn't exist, and now it does. And we also know that it has always existed. We just didn't know how to describe it or how to fight for it, and now we do. Um, the foundation work has always been about all the marginalized communities, race issues, um, feminist issues, the trans community, part of the gay community, some of the gay organizations 20 plus years ago didn't even acknowledge the trans community as being part of what they were fighting for. And that was really an issue, a big issue back then. And now I feel like we're all getting on the same page here, but we all know that hate crimes statistically pick up when there's a positive step forward. So we've seen hate crimes rise against the gay community. We've seen hate crimes rise against, uh, during Pride Month in particular, they just skyrocket. And they're targeting trans folks now uh, in particular because, well, because that's the last bastion of, you know, denying equality. And everyone knows that they have lost that war um, against all the marginalized communities. The hard part now is going to be to implement what we know is right and to codify it into law and get away from executive orders that can be changed in a heartbeat. We need to codify this stuff in law. And to be sending human rights to the Supreme Court, please, let's not do that anymore. Let's codify it into law. Mm. You know, I, I've been in audiences before where you'll say something and I'll look at somebody and we'll whisper, oh my God, did she just say that? Like you say what everybody wants to say and you have the guts to say it. And is that, does that ever get you into trouble or do you feel spontaneous like standing ovations or, or applause? Because you you say what you feel rather than you know doing a Gallup poll or being politically correct. I just think you've got this like this gut and grit that's some part of your personality that I'm envious of not having that kind of gumption when I'm in a room full of people. Have you met my husband? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have, and I love him. But the um, two of you together, it's <laughs> yes. so a, this powerful combination you just say what we all want to hear I, I do have to rein in Dennis occasionally because he would get us in trouble um but I don't know how to I don't know how to spin things I just I just feel like honesty is the best policy and if you don't know if you I'm just saying what I think is wrong or right I pre present my remarks always in the notion that this is my opinion this is what I think um, you know, it's, if I get in trouble, I get in trouble, but I cannot, I just cannot tone down what I know is absolutely wrong. I've even gone so far as to drop the F-bomb a couple of times. And it's like, that probably should have got me in trouble. Well, that's, that's my favorite part. <laughs> I was in the audience when the F-bomb was, was dropped and it was like, 
I think we stamped our feet and we hoot and hollered and thought this is this is glorious. And I'm just it makes me so angry that I really think everybody knows that what's going on is wrong. And especially in the previous administration, we knew it was wrong. But did we do anything about it except complain to our friends? Probably not. Um, did we even vote? Mm, maybe. And in the election of 2016, we knew it was going to be a disaster. If the wrong one won and the wrong one won, and it was a disaster. Everything we knew was going to happen, happened. Um, but did we go to vote? No, we thought, oh, it's a cinch. It is not a cinch. It's never a cinch. We cannot ever neglect our duty to vote. It's our duty. So, You're, yes, I will say what's on my mind, and I will continue to say what's on my mind. And I'm a Wyoming girl. We don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time with uh, a, a wonderful Holocaust survivor um, named Renee Firestone. And her righteous indignation politically aligns with your righteous indignation politically because she felt there was a lot of deja vu moments. And, and what yeah. she would put out in the universe is, I've seen this before, I've lived this before, and this is coming. Yep. And then it was the I told you so. And I wonder for you if you had that same kind of deja vu feeling of, I, I've felt this before, I've lived this before, and then these horrible things would happen. And you had to look around and say, I, I told you so. This, this guy was going to fall and it fell. Was that hard for you? Yes, it was. I'm a product of the 60s, right? So I lived through that very turbulent decade. I was very young. I was I graduated from high school in 19, yeah, yeah, 70s. So I'm really, I'm old now. But um, I lived through that. And even living through it in Wyoming, I saw the horror of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War and the assassinations of our country's leaders and just this chaos of not knowing what to do next, not knowing how we were going to organize and make it right. And then follow that up with Nixon. Oh, my God, what were we thinking? Um, it was, yes, it was definitely, I've been here before. We cannot let this happen again. We just stopped paying attention and began to, again, to take everything for granted that our government people were good because they were running for office. That is not how it works. It's not how it works. All the criminality in the Trump administration was now coming to light because it was enabled by us. We allowed that to happen because we weren't paying attention. We assumed that right was going to win over. Well, it did eventually, but we went through a lot of garbage before we got here and we're still dealing with trauma and the aftermath of that garbage. And we will be for years. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in a decade, high school students were polled about their feelings of the LGBTQ community and the positivity declined, declined. We take our we take our attitudes from leadership. And when we see our leadership espousing that hate and that racism and bigotry, we began to think, oh, well, maybe that's the way it should be. No, it isn't the way it should be. And he uncorked all the hate that had been pushed down by public opinion, um, peer pressure, saying it was wrong. And now it's all out there again. Are we glad we know at least where it's at now? Or do we wish it was corked up again? It'll never be corked up again. It's out there now. Mm. We just can't stop watching and paying attention can't take it for granted ever again, ever again. How do you take that joy and that love and try to rock other folks' foundation that doesn't have that as a core attribute? So how do you spread love and how do you spread joy in your son's mission and mandate? I truly believe you can only change hearts and minds with stories. And when Dennis and I, or anybody from the foundation who has been asked to tell the story of that or the work that we do, we try to make it clear that the work that we do is rooted in love, is rooted in love and peace. And we're only going to get there if we root out those who are against it, who don't want to be in that world. Uh, um, who, who wouldn't in their best day, or, or maybe even in their worst day, want to be in a world of light and peace and happiness and acceptance of their fellow man? I do not want to live in a world of darkness where I have to fear for who I am as a woman, as an older woman, as a, an activist for the gay community. I want to be surrounded by love and understanding and patience and compassion. 
not not anger and hate. And I just don't think we're going to get there unless we all share our own stories of our pain, of our pain when we have been forced to encounter that hate Mm -hmm. and how we have survived it. I just think everybody has to share their stories of love and pain and how they survived it. I, I just lost my mother, as I shared with you, and, and that's part of the healing process and in, in, in grappling with grief is the stories, you know, the, the pain and, and the purpose. And so I, I found myself just sharing a lot of anecdotes and stories. So is there a specific story that when you, when you think of your son that isn't a fence, isn't a hospital bed, it isn't feeling vulnerable and helpless that that when you think of Matthew that you want the world to think of um, because that will allow others to go back and share stories with their loved ones. When I was in grade school, um, back in the day when schools still had Halloween costume parades, do you remember those days, Erin? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for two years in a row, fifth and sixth grade, uh, Matt was Dolly Parton. For <laughs> And he didn't come out till he was 18. (laughs) (laughs) He just thought that she was so um, uh, outrageously out there. And he loved he loved country music. He was a forgive the term closeted country music fan. Um, But he just loved everything about her. And he I had these old maternity shirts. And for some reason, we had this wig and he would put balloons in the blouse and be Dolly Parton. And every year, and the fifth grade was his first year, but the sixth grade, he really had it down. And his teachers were all commenting on how fun it was that he um, wanted to be Dolly Parton for Halloween. All those years ago, a lot of the boys were costumed as female characters because they were easy to imitate, I guess, costume wise. Um, Wonder Woman, uh, you know. Bad girl, all those superhero women, even young, even boys would be. There wasn't the stigma on it then that there, unfortunately, is now. But he loved it, and they loved it, and it was very fun for him to be something so. Uh, and he made it as outrageous as it could be. Um, so you know, maybe if Matt had grown uh, into a man, he would have been into drag. I don't know. Uh, we'll never know. But um, it was a moment where he was very free and very happy, and it. It, t- it tapped into his theatrical uh, tendencies, right? So it was, it was great. Just a few years ago, in fact, his first grade teacher, who he adored, retired. And she sent me photographs that she had of Matt as Dolly Parton. Have you sent them to Dolly? No, she sent them to me. I'm not sending them to Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> She'll never see them. Her people will lose them. So I'm not saying it right now. I think at some point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wish that in the universe. I think, <laughs> I think that Dolly would love that. I think your son would love that. He would love that, yes. Do, yes. You, do you find yourself feeling like, I feel like throughout this amazing interview, what you haven't seen, what I see, is there's these moments of like almost like blinding lights. And I know the sun is peeking through in your Wyoming home right now, but I sort of feel every time that you become illuminated that it's Matt in the room. So are there moments where you do feel him? Yes, there are. You may think I'm weird for saying this, but I don't, whenever I'm doing my, 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 I don't know what to call them, lectures, programs, whatever at a college or, an employee resource group or whatever, wherever I am, I never prepare anything ever. Um, I tried notes in the beginning, but I never looked at them. So I just, that was a waste of time and energy on my part. But I know that when I get in front of the microphone, I know exactly what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like Matt's, Matt is coaching me because Dennis and I both feel like we're doing the work he would be doing if he were still here. So whatever we say comes out in that moment Um, We have, of course, listened to the, if there are any other speakers, to sort of encompass what they are saying, you know, to stay on on track with the message of the night or or the gathering. But the core of the message always comes when we're in front of the microphone, always. And it's 
always unique and it's always inspiring. And I, I've always used the word when I describe you that you're channeling him. I, I just, I feel that it's, it's just that, like you said, it's this effortless moment that puts everybody at ease. But the fact that you don't have notes, that you don't use a teleprompter, that it's not scripted is so genuine. And I think people need that that genuine connection with him and with you and a cause. It's it's tr- it's truly a gift. It's truly a gift. I've never felt comfortable feeling that these people in front of me didn't come here to see me read something. Even if I'm doing it on a teleprompter, I'm still reading it, right? You can't, you, it's, it, I just, it never felt real to me. And I, of all the ones, lectures I have been to in my in my life, the ones that have lasted, I've been the ones where the people just talk to me. The highest compliment I ever get from my programs are, I didn't know Mrs. Shepard could be funny. Oh, you're hysterical. <laughs> they, I don't know, they go expecting some, you know, I'm going to be crying through the whole thing or angry or whatever, but um, that just, I know they're not going to listen to me if that's all I have to say. And I am funny, damn it. <laughs> so I have two last questions for you. Uh, sure. One is piggybacking off what you just said. Um, You've got this captive audience of, of educators, their family, and their students. And if you, if you could talk to the young boy in fifth and sixth grade who wants to dress up of whatever icon there is now, whether it's a Dolly Parton then or, or a Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman now, if you could just talk to me, i.e. that boy, getting ready for Halloween and thinking about their costume. Um, Speak to that kid first, where he feels like Judy Shepard talked to me. Just, just be yourself. Don't let anybody else tell you who you should be. It will, it will impact even at the age of 10. People telling you who you should be or what they want from you is, going, is not going to positively affect your life. It may give you ideas, for sure, or goals that you, that you want to do. But having someone dictate to you who you should be or how you should live your life is not the path to follow. You need to follow what is in your heart um, because that is the only way you will ever feel fulfilled is to do what is in your heart and in your mind. What makes you happy? What do you want to achieve? What are your hopes and goals? And ask yourself that every day of your life. If you were able to speak directly to Matt, which I know you do every moment of every day, where you're not channeling him, now you're channeling a mother's love and devotion. What would you channel to your son that is only to your son? And we, for a moment, get to be voyeuristic and see that love and devotion and and truly understand what love looks like. Um, Well, Matt, you made it, you're famous. (laughs) You're famous. We all love you, we miss you like the Dickens. Um, I don't like to see you be Dolly Parton today. Um, I just wish you were here to see what you have accomplished a lot. I told our audience we were going to cry. I told them. Um, I will follow you and your movement to the ends of the earth. I will promote you with every breath in my being. And I will encourage people to support, to educate, and to be a part of what you are doing. Because Judy, you and your husband have created something that is bigger than yourselves. And so please consider myself and those that I humbly serve part of your mission, part of your army. Um, I want every part of our mission, Erin. <laughs> you absolutely um, are. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean that sincerely. I just, I, I feel you and what you do in the core of my being. And I just want everyone that I know and love and, and here to also be a part of this. Um, you're, you're doing God's work and your son is famous um, more so than he ever expected, but it's the kind of fame that's not fleeting. And it's the kind of fame that doesn't need a star on the Hollywood Boulevard or a gold statue. It's the kind of fame when we quote people like Dr. Martin Luther King or an Anne Frank, the fact that your son has made such great change for the globe is the kind of fame that will make him immortal. 
Thank you, Aaron. It's strange to say that I'm both excited and sad about why we are gathered here today. The reason I'm excited is I'm gonna have a chit chat with two young women who I revere and cherish and who are storytellers and their stories are global. Kanya is an original Freedom Writer and her story is a part of the Freedom Writer's Diary. Jackie is a beloved actress and was able to take a combination of Kanya and a Freedom Writer named Bunny and bring their stories to life in the Freedom Writers film. And so for years, people have been reading and watching their stories unfold. But the reason we are gathering today is there's this sense of urgency and a call to action and the hashtag, hashtag stop Asian American Pacific Islander hate because the world is not right, the world is not normal, and there's been so many hate crimes, um, not just here in America, but abroad. So we're gonna talk about race. We're gonna talk about inequality. We're gonna talk about people who are bullies at bully pulpits and fan those fires. It's gonna be emotional, it's gonna be telling, and it's gonna be personal. And so what I want to do first and foremost is do a little temperature check um, for both of you because this wave of hate crimes is so real and so relevant in your lives and in your community. How are you feeling about our subject today? Uh, hashtag stop AAPI hate. I'm so angry, upset, scared for my family, for my sons, for everybody. Um, just like what's going on and we can't be numb to this. We can't allow this to go on. You know, we have to feel that that this matters, that we can't be numb that it's okay for things to be okay the way it is. It's not okay at all. What I love about my sweet uh, Kanye is, as a freedom writer, she's an activist, not just an author, but she's also an advocate for the whole human race. And so I love that even though we're, we're speaking specifically of discrimination within the Asian community, um, you are a humanist and you don't want discrimination in any community. So I'm proud of that. Jackie, yeah. um, your face is on the screen. Your face is in people's homes on their TV sets and for all those cool kids on their gadgets. Um, so what I love about you, about being a storyteller on the big screen is you have credibility. People look at you and say, I look like you and I talk like you and I wanna be like you. So if there's a kid at home that wants to be like you, um, how could you empower them about using their voice during these uncertain times. Yes, yes, I mean, I, I, thank you so much for that. I mean, I think for, for me personally, it had always been a struggle to imagine myself being seen in a Hollywood kind of way, to, to actually be in a film and be seen. And I think being someone who's, you know, Filipino or, you know, Southeast Asian, someone who's, you know, with this complexion as an Asian person, being seen on films so new for me. And um, I think that it trips me out. I, I think back at like being in the film and I'm like, I can't believe I was actually able to, in a way, to channel Kanye and Bunny and to channel myself, to represent myself. It is insane to me when I think about it because I didn't have that growing up. I got chills just now when you yeah, said that. At, you know, and, and um, so, I mean, that being said, yeah, for, for kids that are, <laughs> for, you know, especially Asian kids who are not considered, I mean, the, the model minority myth is a myth, but especially the Asian kids that just never even were considered the model minority, like, which is, the, you know, these characters that were like the bad Asians <laughs> or whatever, you know what I mean, in the hood. <laughs> um, uh, God, I mean, I, I think, it's, it's an honor to be able to, to represent and to have a voice. And I think, you know, what I would say to them is push, push hard and kick it and do fight because that's what we have to do, you know? And, and um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I think of that. 
I'm going to say a, a, a wave of emotion yeah. really just washed over me because you said some words effortlessly that are loaded. Um, bad kids. Yeah. Oh, model minority. Yeah. Um, kids that live in the hood. And I know when you're saying that, um, I want to go to you, my sweet Kanye, because what you wrote about in the Freedom Writer's Diary was a, a singular image. I'm going to get emotional about wanting desperately to be perceived as a lotus flower. Um, taking what Jackie said about being of Asian descent, you were not the model minority. Um, being poor and being a genocide survivor yourself. Tell our listeners and our watchers about what that image of a lotus flower is and how you want to project how you want to be seen. Um, model, uh, I never thought of myself as a model, um, if anything, I thought of myself as being invisible. Um, uh, you know, my parents survived the genocide, and when it came to America, you know, it's just the language barrier, the cultural difference, being different, you know, being the skin tone that I am, um, you know, I was always picked on growing up throughout school, you know, throughout my whole life until you can't, came into my life, I was pretty much, it felt like I didn't matter. I was invisible, I didn't care about anything. Like, coming from a country, war-torn country that slaughtered almost two million people, their people, and just coming here, there's like this heaviness of, that I always felt like, why, you know, why, why did this happen to me? Like, why am not like normal other kids? I always felt like, why could I have been born to a different family or a different culture? I always like yearned to be somebody else that I wasn't throughout my whole life until I really had to do some inner work and dig deep and to really come to terms and acceptance of who I am and, and living my story. And then being able to tell my story from a place of I went through that, all the pain, you know, the identification of trying to be somebody I'm not, trying to be cool, being a bullied, being bullied, you know, to um, just somebody believing in me um, and saying that, and just teaching education, just love and, and acceptance and awareness about everything that, that went on. Um, through junior high school, the time in the early 1990s in Long Beach, you know, I grew up where we weren't allowed to play with other kids that were not Asians. The Mexican kids didn't want to play with us and they called us, you know, um, dog eaters, um, comments like that. And I would walk a certain way, avoiding, you know, the house, knowing that I would be bullied going, crossing, you know, their fence or going to school, you kind of just stick to your own kind. Um, it was not until room, you know, 203 that learning about history and learning about friendship, crossing boundaries, it wasn't about identifying that that person is this color and that color. It was just, that was Tiffany. No, that was Erica. You know, that was Tony. It, like, I didn't see colors. Mm. You know, I, I, I mentioned the, the lotus flower because Kanye writes about this image. And a lotus flower, as she writes, is this beautiful, dainty flower that grows out of the mud and the muck and is so regal. And, and you are so regal. And you portray her and Bunny alike. So the scene in the film that I think you did so beautifully is you're, you're coming into your ninth grade year. And when Kanya and Bunny were coming out of junior high, they put on this persona that they were really tough and they kind of dressed like gangsters. And it was an act, you know, if I, if I look tough and I act tough, then I'm not going to get bullied. Yeah. And in the scene in the film where you are asked to stand on the line and you ask a question about if a refugee camp counts, um, when I asked if you've ever been incarcerated, unbeknownst to you, um, 
Kanye was born in a refugee camp. So you would you embodied that moment. And I think in the film, when you make that decision to actually step forward and stand on that line, you're paying homage to her heritage. You're paying homage to a family torn apart by a genocide in Cambodia. So what does that feel like to be in that presence? Um, oh my God. Right now I'm just like, um, I mean, no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about you, Kanye. And I mean, right now I just feel extremely honored, you know? I mean, I think for me at the time, you know, because I was a teenager going through my own little microcosm of something very similar, like in the sense of, you know, just being kind of an outcast, you know, in my own personal life. I just was kind of in my own like bubble of like, okay, like I'm just bringing this character to life that I can relate to. And now, so many years later, as an adult looking back at it, I'm just, I'm riveted by how there's so much of a parallel. It's almost, it's like how they say like, like intergenerational trauma or like, you know, his, just all these like, it's like, it's almost like this weird like, it's like a sci-fi connection of like, you know, of emotions and like intersecting like histories. And I think it's really beautiful. And I feel really honored and riveted. I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. Um, but at the same time, there's this intuition and this feeling of knowing too that, the, that it's so meaningful. That there was something so real about it that I did feel in my gut about this story even though I didn't know the, this actual fact, you know? And I think that that's kind of magical and amazing, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm just, I just feel really honored to have been able to like participate and like just lend myself to like help like bring, you know, the story to life and give it, a, you know, give it whatever it needs for other people to be able to learn from it. So I just feel extremely like, oh my God. You know, when it, you, you both have talked about uh, with your Asian culture, there seems to be this unspoken hierarchy. Uh, both of you have grandparents who were of Chinese descent. You also have Chinese uh, and Cambodian descent, and you are Chinese and Filipino. Mm -hmm. You both mention skin color. When I look at you guys, you're beautiful. You're you're just you know like any Southern California kid. You, you've got you've been kissed by the sun. <laughs> but there, let's talk about skin color because it's almost this unspoken rule that if you have been kissed by the sun, that's a bad thing. And I want, I want to understand that for those that don't understand that kind of intrinsic racism and socioeconomic bonds within the Asian community, is skin color a factor? Absolutely. Huge factor. Yeah. Dude. Automatically, mm -hmm. you're just kind of coded, oh, this person is from that social economic background and their education blah 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 already mm -hmm. it's kind of like so mm -hmm. yes absolutely yes yes socioeconomic profiling and beauty beauty standards yes. too like i remember i mean i i've heard it in my family i hate to say it but it's like you know when when you i was born this color you know i was sun kids out the womb yeah and the <laughs> womb <laughs> got me and you know, it's like there's always a little bit extra excitement when like a baby's born and they're more like, porcelain skin, you know, like, oh, oh my beauty, be beautiful girl, you know, it's like, oh, oh, darker brown girl, oh, oh, okay, you know what I mean? It's it's sad, but it's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real thing. You know, I think colorism in the Asian community is a real thing that a lot of people don't want to talk about, or is not really talked about. It's not talked about. It's not talked it's about, but like, it's known. Yes. You know? It's just a, so let's yeah. talk about it. Um, I, 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 I'm fascinated by this. Do you feel that there's clearly prejudice against the darker shades? Yes. Is there a hierarchy, do you think, even um, with the shades that are represented on a screen? Absolutely. On a television? So tell me about that for those of us to try to stop that prejudice from being perpetuated. Oh my goodness. I mean, absolutely. I mean, for myself, like all the Asian actresses or Asian, all the Asian people that would be on film, you know, on the silver screen would always be most identify as East Asian. So usually the lighter skin, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. And I'm not, that is not to say there's no such thing as, you know, anyone from those groups that are of a darker skin shade. But, but what I mean is that, you know, to be a light skin Asian person or, or to be fair skin, 
is always just like the most visible on in social media uh, in uh, in in pop culture in in the media and in all media you know what i mean um and it, it it's like from i think yeah from tv to film all the way down to like households you know where it's just kind of like <sighs> I mean, it's it's historical too. It's like you know, if you're if you're brown skin, that means you're out in the sun because you're a, a farmer or a, right. a, a slave, a servant. You know what I mean? It's it's just it's all tied to those things, you know. And it's crazy to think that even now in 2021, it's like just now I feel like there is a little more visibility for Southeast Asian culture, you know. But for so long, I feel like we were just. I feel like Freedom Riders was like the first movie I can really think of where you saw someone who's Cambo a character who's Cambodian. You know, and then I mean, there's there are other like few like like um, independent films that may have like da done that as well, yes, but not in like a big like film like this, or you know, you don't really have brown Asians <laughs> on TV, you know. Well, you know what I, I love that we're doing with this courageous conversation today is it's the people that have the power mm -hmm. that have to do more than just putting out a statement. You know, if yeah. you watch any television right now, everyone is putting out these statements for their network or mm -hmm. um, radio ads or even companies. But you can't just put out a statement you have to do. Absolutely. So what I loved is they hired you. Yeah. Our book spotlights exactly. you. So what does that mean about giving voice to the, the potpourri of communities that you're from, the colors of skin that you represent. How important is that for young people to see that representation? Oh my God, I think it's extremely important. I think it's like, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, there's also a belief that, I've heard this before too, because as like an Asian actor, you know, there were, people will say, oh, well, um, there are lesser uh, Asian roles, so that means that there's lesser Asian actors, so there's less competition, so it's easier for you. You know, and it's like, uh, no, actually, that means there's less opportunity, so there's less growth, you know, for Asian actors. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, like, I have a bigger chance of booking a, a, a role that is open to all ethnicities as opposed to an Asian role because I don't, a lot of people, don't, you know, especially growing up, didn't see me as the typical Asian girl, like, geeky, like, I don't, I don't I tell you. condone this at all, but the stereotype of nerdy, fair-skinned, geeky Asian girl who's really good at school. Like, that was so never ever me, <laughs> you know? And as an actor, it's like that, even now as I speak, that's not me. And I would have a bigger chance of booking a, uh, it's a blind ethnicity, no ethnic uh, ethnicity attached to a role, but it's just all about character. So anyway, that being said, I feel like yeah, it's, the powers that be do need to have more opportunities, but also people that want to do something, like Asian people that want to act, for instance, they shouldn't let the fact that it's such a small, there's less visibility stop them. Because I think some, and I've heard this before, where they're like, oh, well, there aren't that many good Asian actors. Oh, no, there's not many good uh, roles for Asian actors, because there's not many good Asian actors. Excuse me. I mean, and then it becomes a... a conversation like chicken or the egg it's like well maybe if there was more um importance more value added to the idea of asian people in the arts you know instead of like being pressured to be something else because they feel that there's no room for them in whatever hollywood you know so it's just it's a lot of different things it's a back and forth but i think what's going to happen that's interesting in in 2021 is hindsight is 2020, so we can look back. And I, I think of some of the films that I saw when I was younger, um, you know, a John Hughes film had such horrific Asian caricatures. Oh my God. And I'm hopeful now when I've gone back and watched a film like Pretty in Pink, and there's moments that are cringeworthy, uh -huh. and I think we are perpetuating these stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. On the screen. Um, and it becomes innocuous. People think, well, it's in a movie, so that's the way it it's is. It's okay, yeah. Actually, that's Kanye and I just earlier were talking about how often, like, Asian, the Asian community is always, like, this, the butt of jokes, you know? And I think it's because of this, like, historical narrative in media, in TV and film that Hollywood perpetuates that is like, it's okay to make fun of Asian people because they've been a caricature for so long and it still carries on today, you know, and then into, and then the Trump administration using all that really terrible rhetoric 
And to now, where it's like, now it's obvious, it's never, it was always a terrible joke, it was always racism, but now people, it's just violence. Yeah. It's not just bullying and, you know, mean, like, oh, come on, laugh at it, take a joke. No, it's actual, now, now it's culminated into violence. And so now where are we at, you know? I want to talk about that because you are a survivor and your parents are survivors of a genocide. And so what I intuitively knew that could happen, happened. When the pandemic hit, your mom was triggered, um, as so many survivors. You know, when you're having uh, food taken off shelves, and those you know those first few weeks of the pandemic, where we didn't have enough information. I'm sure your mother, who lived through a war, um, went to a refugee camp, came to America very poor, psychologically probably had a lot of triggers, mm-hmm. and then to hear the president, the then president, say the China flu or the Kung flu and to perpetuate that from a place of power. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that for you because um, you were living that truth of, of seeing your, your mother panicking and fearful and society panicking and fearful mm-hmm. and then someone in a place of authority and power perpetuating these horrible stereotypes. Mm-hmm. So what was that like initially when you heard those horrible stereotypes and he was never held accountable. And then others also uttered those horrible stereotypes. It's just all triggered symptoms of like a civil war. You know, it started political statements like that. Um, and just, you know, like what happened in Cambodia, and, you know, that they took over. For example, they, they tell people in the city, in Phnom Penh, to pack all your stuff you know, and to leave the city, you're going to be coming back in an, um, in in a few days. So they left the city with just, you know, whatever they can carry with them into the jungles, into the fields. But they didn't know that they were being led off to be killed. And for our viewers, um, the, the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, um, the, the Khmer Rouge, targeted uh, one half of Kanye's family. They went after the intelligentsia. They went after people who were learned and scholarly, who knew better, who could fight back. So half of your family was being tricked into giving up all their worldly possessions, yes. uh, lured to their death. Mm-hmm. And then on your father's side, because they were um, working the land, they were also um, suddenly put on this pedestal because they weren't fighting back. So that that the second this pandemic hit, your mother must have been that young girl in Cambodia. Yes. Yeah, again, again the, the the whole thing, it's just like, we went to Costco, how, how many trips a day? Oh, our house became like a storefront, you know, with like how many toilet papers or supplies. And it was just like, you know, but going back to the war, even something like salt that we take for granted and only cost a few, less than a dollar, was like worth more than gold. You know, there was nothing to eat, and then all that. And she kept saying, "You don't know how it is to not have food to eat." And I was like, "Oh my god! Like, I really don't. I really don't." And I really feel bad. You know that. Even my aunt talks about it. Like, she she didn't have her period for years because there was no food. Yeah, I think, I think what a lot of people don't realize is um, for survivors, Holocaust survivors, um, genocide survivors, when you're starving, your body shuts off because your body intuitively knows I can't carry a child to term. So the fact that your mom stopped having her period, um, it's a blessing that she got it back to have you. Um, but I, I know that must have been so painful for her because I don't think she was ready to be a mother when she conceived you. Yeah, no, um, my parents were enraged uh, by, they kind of, you know, they paired you off with, I don't know, it was just like a jungle, a mess that you gave people power and they took it out of hand and they went to war and they paired people up with the dark skin. Asian, like the darker skin Cambodian with the lighter skin, you know, killed off whoever said who knew how, who seemed educated. Mm-hmm. You wore glasses, you know, 
anything. You were just target for any reason. They was just, it was just, they were hungry to kill people off. Mm -hmm. I don't understand, you know. Till today, I don't understand that that something like that so horrific could happen. And it starts with the comments of going back to your darker skin. It starts something small as, oh yeah, you know, you're fat. Oh, you this. The labeling, those, those, those like small remarks that kind of builds momentum over time. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, say that to me again. And then after a while, and then this culminates into this hatred, and it ha and it, 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 it got acted out. My heart is breaking, and I, I know that for you as an activist, what I've loved watching is your your activism rise in this mm -hmm. moment of, of speaking up and speaking out. And so what was that like, um, knowing folks that did uh, come here out of necessity and wanting to, to know if there is this American dream, and then Americans mm -hmm. saying things like a China flu, oh Americans God. saying, Kung Fu, yeah. uh, Americans fetishizing women. Oh my God. So talk about that, because I know you're an activist, oh and I know God. you're feeling her pain right now. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. Talk about those feelings of, of watching these things unfold yes. over this last year. Yeah, I mean, it, it's surreal, but at the same time, it's something that, and it's really horrible to say, but it's something that's been known. I think that everything is just boiling over right now, which is absolutely unacceptable, and it's, it's a shame that it's had to come to this. But I mean, it's just like my, I, it's like the rage and anguish is just like, it, I remember when I first heard about what happened in Atlanta, I could, didn't even want to like, I, I, I knew what happened. I found, you know, I, I read the articles and this and that, but after that, after immediately reading, I kind of like shut off. I like was like, I don't want to think right now about it. I just don't, don't want to think because I was so furious like so furious because to me that was the uh, exactly i mean it, like not only have just women's bodies been abused throughout all of history but asian women being basically sacrificed because of a white supremacist like insane person who now, and then how the media wanted to turn it into, oh, well, you know, he's a sex addict. Oh, he was having a bad day. And then, like, people in power just being like, ah. And it's like, you know, a kid, a black kid will get shot for having a, 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 a toy in his pocket that he's reaching for. But this guy who plans an attack to kill these women and somehow kind of rationalizes it because it's like, oh, well, they're sex workers. They could have been sex workers. It's a seedy place. I mean, to me, it all ties into this idea of it's of um, colonialism and also just like Asian women being fetishized all throughout history. Oh, well, they're complimenting you. That's just like a compliment. Mm. You're a hot Asian girl. Oh, well, you know, Asian girls, da, 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 all this stuff. And it's, it's not a compliment. It's to say someone is beautiful is a compliment, but to fetishize them is a totally different thing. And you're, you're basically weaponizing your suddenly your own identity becomes a weapon to yourself because they've turned you into that so oh because uh she's this you know these individuals were asian sex workers okay so they got gunned down whatever no it's not whatever it's not okay and it was you victim know? shaming when you, when yes you it's victim shaming yes. i love that you talked about uh so the gunman for those that uh, don't live in america um was a young caucasian man i think it was like in 1920, mm -hmm. uh, a self-proclaimed sex addict, and he targeted these massage parlors. Yeah. So we don't even know um, if these women were just going there for their day Exactly. Job. And yeah. suddenly these women got vilified. Yes, And exactly. instead of being the victim, yeah. suddenly they were shamed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were targeted, and it was methodical. Exactly. And so I, let's go back to that, exactly. that, that fetishizing. I think that's really mm -hmm. important. For, for young people to understand that you are a human being. You're exactly. not a caricature, you're not a sex symbol. Yes. And, and how, how wrong and degrading that yes, is. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it, it's uh, it's terrible. I can't remember the actual, uh, it was a law that from like, I think 1831 or something where Asian women were not allowed to migrate 
to America because they were considered, because they, they just assumed that they would be prostitutes, you know? And it's just like, whoa, you know, our, our entire existence has been colored by, uh, has been hypersexualized because of someone else, not because of us yeah. at all. It's not your narrative. It's no, someone else's narrative. It's, uh, yes, exactly. Or like uh, our narrative has been shaped by someone completely outside of us, and we are now being subjected to all these weird, crazy like violences, and it's just like, what? You know what I mean? And and absolutely, it's a big one. I think you know. And it, again, I think it does boil down to visibility, representation. You know, like Asian women not just being like a hot like uh, like sex object or like kung fu fighting sex object you know what i mean like it's we're people <laughs> we're just normal normal people so I, i'm assuming <laughs> for both of you there's got to be this fear factor um because i know that both of you were so engaged in black lives matter mm -hmm. i am you're activists and this is a year of social protesting and, and racial reckoning and then the violence and we saw these acts of violence um, in a subway in New York oh, or God. on the streets of San Francisco or an older woman in San Jose. So we started seeing these moments that were deliberate and, mm -hmm. and targeted attacks. So did you personally ever feel afraid? Did you ever feel judged when you left your cocoon, your bubble, and went out into the world? I feel like that right now. Mm -hmm. I never had to feel like that before. But now, as the media is bringing this to light, I now have to look left and right mm -hmm. when I enter the car or where, you know, I don't know if I'm parking my car next door and um, so-and-so next to me is feeling triggered and all the things mm -hmm. that I'm the, uh, like, you know, because of you, the coronavirus, mm -hmm. which I have no clue, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I, but, it, like... So it's like, and I'm fearful now. I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, I can't live normal lives. Mm -hmm. I can't go to the grocery store without thinking that I'm being judged mm -hmm. or, you know, going shopping or being treated differently just because of the way I look. Mm -hmm. Like, what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. I've, it's, I've, I've felt that growing up, but now it's like, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Have you felt that as well? You know, I think for me, it's it's been a really weird, I've been dealing and coping in a very strange way because I can be very just like, hold on, don't want to deal. But basically, like, for me, it's kind of been from the outside. It's like more from coming from my outside circle and then circling into me. So I am the most anxious right now. I just keep thinking about, like, my parents and my aunts and uncles because so many you know, elderly Asian people have been targeted and I'm just mm -hmm. like, and they they go to, you know, they're out and about. Like they're not, of course they're at home most of the time, but they're going to the stores, they're going, my, you know, my dad's getting gas somewhere and, I'm, and mm -hmm. I keep thinking like, oh my God, what if something happens? Because they're so helpless. Right. So that is something that's like constantly on my mind. Mm -hmm. And then when it, and then I'm starting to, and then as, the, as I started hearing more stories and I started thinking about all my like, just as like all the Asian women and, and like, and men too, but like most specifically Asian women in my life, they're like my friends. And I'm just like, my heart, I get so scared. I get really anxious. I'm like, oh my God, I hope nothing ever happens to them when they're like walking to their car or anything. And then when I think about me, I'm just like, ooh, someone better try. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you are yeah, right now. I'm in that place. I'm so mad. I am so mad. I'm like, someone better try me right now and I and I don't mean to like I, I, I don't want more and more violence to keep exploding on the streets I don't want that but at the same time you know I, I just need to express that I'm so angry and like I'm so just like in this place of like I don't know like I, I'm just ready to I just want to fight fire with fire but that's just me like kind of processing everything and like and there is a little kind of monkey on my back that is fearful and it's just like to be careful like and when I do stuff I've always of course as women we always feel that way anyway when right. I go somewhere like oh my gosh like there's always creeps everywhere whatever but now it's like oh my gosh racialized stuff you're like damn some random ass person could just cause a stunt, you know, and it's just like, and you don't even know. Yeah. I thought that Jackie talked about 
it was the older, more vulnerable mm-hmm. who seemed to be the targets. And we, and people in the age of cell phones, thank God, we're seeing these images mm-hmm. of of elders just walking and being attacked and pummeled and sometimes fighting back. Thank goodness, mm-hmm. but because you, your mother is elderly, what is that fear for you? You know, you were already afraid with the pandemic and now it's the fear of she's lived through a war. Mm-hmm. Um, there can't be a war in this country and it is, it's an invisible war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now I'm like fearful for her to even walk out the house mm-hmm. just, just because, or anybody to walk out the house, I'm just afraid. Like why are they being targeted? They can't fight back. Mm-hmm. And then within the Asian culture, they're not going to be loud about it and express it or, you know what I mean? We're, we're, it's just in our culture, we're taught to suppress things. It's kind of like, um, you know, it, uh, there's a mentality within even my culture, I don't know if it's yours, but it's like the more you pressure, you just like, oh, you're going to fail. But it's kind of like the backward thinking, like you're fell, but so you can win. You know what I mean? So they don't, they don't like to compliment you. Mm-hmm. They like to put you down so that you can bring yourself up. Mm-hmm. So with this is coming up, the, you know, they kind of just kind of brace it, and that's not acceptable. Like, why do you have to hurt somebody who's so innocent? And I tried to explain what's happening to an eight-year-old, and he was like, and I asked him, "Did you create the coronavirus? Because he's Asian." He's like, no, I don't know anything, you know? And it's like, but that doesn't make sense, Auntie. I'm like, exactly. How do you explain racism to an eight-year-old? He's like, I, I don't agree. Like, if you have issues with somebody, why do you have to take it out with the out on them with violence? Mm-hmm. And it's not just the violence, it's the words. Let's go yes. back to the words. Mm-hmm. Um, what I love, you're, you're a writer, and your livelihood is through words. And... What I love that you were able to do in your stories is to identify those words that are really hurtful. Um, and so I want to I want to talk about when people stand idly by and don't say anything. Like if you've been in mixed company before mm-hmm. and you've heard something racist, um, I believe that the Freedom Riders are now in a place where we stand up and we speak up. Mm-hmm. But not everybody does that. So have you ever been um, out and about? and called something so horrifically racist and people went about their business and people didn't interrupt and people didn't say that's horrible has, has that ever happened to you oh yeah it has um, like uh oh yeah chinese oh you know um you guys create the coronavirus like they've said that you're, you they've said that yeah, you're like oh uh, yeah I, like i sent some chinese new year because i'm half chinese oh that's the coronavirus new year Oh my god, I'm like, and that's my friend, so they're not my friend anymore, uh, but I was like so ignorant. Oh, no. <laughs> Have you ever been called a, a derogatory or racist term and, and people didn't stand up for you? Um, I, well, yeah, when I was a kid, like growing up in elementary school and middle school, yeah, I mean, it was the bullying and stuff like that for just, just, just being, it, it's interesting how like, just, they would just call me Chinese. Chinese, yeah. And, and that's not like an actual, like, to be Chinese, there's nothing wrong with that. But to just have that just be, like, vilify you. Correct. And it's just like, you, well, you're Chinese. Oh, little Chinita. Oh, duh. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, little China or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. Kind of, and so, and that was like, it would just be like groups of kids doing that, you know? And it's mm-hmm. just like, okay. And you just, just had to... And so, teachers didn't intervene, or the, the I mean, it was the, just never talked about, like yeah. really, yeah. And and how do you go? Um, who do you say it yeah, to? And it's, it's so it yeah, and it's so Yeah, it feels kind of yeah. It's interesting, you know. Then you feel ashamed and embarrassed. Yeah, and it's it's almost like you would kind of like take on the blame for whatever reason, and then you just don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. really sad. But you internalize all that pain, and and I think you know, as we're talking about like with words and everything, it's like it's this like violence of the mind it's this violence in our words you know that is that now like finally it's being enacted in so many ways which is so like terrifying you know but it absolutely starts with the the language it starts with words so I, I love that our audience is always this beautiful fusion of you know really proactive parents you know talented teachers and then the youth and so if you could look right at that parent or that teacher 
Tell them the importance of words and about not standing idly by and not being silent when they hear these things. Like give them, give them a mandate, give them a mission to to leave this call to action feeling emboldened. What, what, what could you say to those individuals? I would say like if you hear something, um, I think that sometimes you need to be an advocate for somebody else who doesn't have a voice. Because sometimes, most of the time, the person who's being the victim doesn't know and probably is not used to having to stand up. So if you hear something, somebody making kind of comments that are not respectful, they say, you know what, that's not really nice. Well, why did you have to say that? Mm -hmm. We should become a society of that, that that's not okay. Or within our own family, within our communities, and even as we see it, that that's not okay to make those remarks. Like, why are we being picked? You know, what is this becoming? And what are we continuing to, see to allow? And it starts with the words. It starts with, like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. You don't know the effects and the trauma of that one word, calling that person that dark skin, that ugly, you don't know how much damage that person, that they, that, that can really eat at that person. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think my favorite scene of you in the, the feature film, Jackie, is the character Ava, who's your friend April Hernandez, um, is having this kind of tearful moment with the teacher, Hilary Swig, um, who, it's so weird when I met her because she really got all, all my quirks down. She, yeah, she's just she's a great job. <laughs> kind of um, yeah. But Ava's kind of emotional, and you walk in, and, and throughout the, the film, you guys were rivals. And the, that simple gesture of makeup, mm. and that simple gesture of you saying, I got your color, um, is so simple, and yet it's not simple. It's so profound. Mm. So I, I love that moment of two rivals coming together. Mm-hmm. And I think because you guys were both coming from a minority position, Absolutely. it was this beautiful kinship suddenly. Absolutely. So tell me what, what that scene was like to film, and did you know when you were filming it that it would be one of those moments that, that made a lot of people weep? You know, at the time when I was filming it, no, I didn't realize that it would be a, a moment that would make, it would, that was like a tearjerker. I, at the time, I didn't realize that. To me, I was just kind of like, okay, we're doing this thing, this, you know, I just kind of stayed very like just grounded and about it. Didn't try to think too hard about it. But at the same time, the, I I always loved that scene. Even before I was really looking forward to it because to me it just resonated so much in the sense of like for me growing up in LA, like as just like you know working class kid that was getting in and out of trouble every now you know, and it, it just reminded me of. It, it was just so to me like universal like this moment of like two girls two strong women like young women just being like all right we fought all right let bygones be bygones you know what i mean it's kind of just like i felt like that was something that just really resonated with me at the time as a kid because i felt like i had so much like you know just intense like craziness around me and i feel like the only way you can get through it is to just like face that person and just like open you know but it's only after kind of like basically fighting with them in a way but you know and and it was it was really awesome I mean it was it just felt like pretty magical (laughs) um but now that I look back at it you know I feel like that scene is exactly what we need right now you know it's this is about and especially among women but you know it's, it's among everyone like Everyone just, it's about solidarity, it's about becoming a collective, and about recognizing each other's bleeding hearts and being like, oh God, like I have you, you have me, like let's do this, like let's just come together. Because, you know, I think that's, I mean, I think it's so beautiful that so many people that, like BLM, totally supports, um, you know, stop Asian hate and has been very active about, like, supporting, like, Asian brothers and sisters, you know what I mean? And I think that's ex- that's what we need right now. I think everyone needs, we've all been pitted against each other for so long because of all these different historical reasons. And But right now, the only way to defeat that is if we just all come together and recognize like we have to fight together, 
you know, and I think Eva and Cindy, that's exactly what they're doing in their small little with the little like L'Oreal makeup <laughs> compact, be like, I got, I got your color. color. You know what I mean? Like, I think it goes back you. to color again. I yeah, and it does, the, like, the symbolism of yeah, that. It's yeah. so beautiful, but Beauty. I, I, I Yeah, color. exactly. But let's talk about makeup, because I think that I, I think what's really disturbing is in that color spectrum, the power and, and um, disturbing way of bleaching. Oh my God. And whitening. And that's, that's like a whole industry. Can we, mm. can we talk about that? I think a lot of men don't know. Um, the pressures for women, especially in that spectrum with, you know, the Freedom Riders, with our African-American Freedom Riders, our Latino Freedom Riders, our Asian-Americans, there was always this feeling, the lighter you were mm-hmm. within that particular ethnicity. Mm-hmm. And so, can you talk about that, that, that weird pressure of bleaching skin or whitening skin or not tanning mm-hmm. and how that's being perpetuated by the beauty industry? Uh, yeah, going back to what Jackie was saying, how, you know, that our skin tone, where it's, con- well, I, I'm born like this, I'm considered darker tone within my community. And so, you know, I get mixed feelings. And um, you know, my older sister, she's fair skin. So, you know, even within my own family, there's like this difference. And um, like, yeah. Right now, what's going on is that they're selling beauty cream products that are whitening. And just most mm. recently, a friend of mine gave me some samples of some whitening <laughs> cream. No! <laughs> no. It's never ending. We are not going to stand oh idly by. No! No, <laughs> no. no <laughs> silence among this crew. Oh and she told me that for a whole kit, it costs $1,000. And I was wow. like, wow. And she's like, yes, you can get your money back in three days. And I was oh. like, no, thank you. I'm just gonna it's accept. It's insulting, isn't it? I'm gonna accept my skin because yeah. I'm not. That, I don't know the side effects of this product. I mean, and, yeah, it's scary. But it's huge business, and I know friends and uh, that they wear. They don't go out in the sun until it gets. You know, the sun is like not it's high. It's like noon time. Mm-hmm. They're inside and they're covered up. And if they're driving, they have they have long sleeves you know driving they covered up with hats everything they don't come out like yeah. sunscreen all the way yeah. whitening <laughs> creams just because within our community the more fair skin you're treated as more prevalent as mm-hmm. more like upper class mm-hmm. and the dark you are it means that you're from you know mm-hmm. you're a farmer mm-hmm. you're out in the sun you're mm-hmm. out in the fields so i think you guys can you guys are challenging a lot of um what was considered the status quo, you guys are gonna blow it up. You know, blow up the, the goal. media, That's the blow goal. up uh, <laughs> networks, and, and blow up the beauty industry. Because I think that a lot of people have made so much money off the backs of those stereotypes, mm-hmm. off the backs of yeah. perpetuating mm-hmm. discrimination. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, it's not just about a statement, it, you got you have to do. So what, what if you could blow up something, what would you blow up that, that has oppressed or made you feel less than? Mm. Why can't we just accept people as who they are? Mm-hmm. Just as your unique beauty that you've been blessed with. Like, why we have to look like so and so? Why can't you just be who you are? Embrace and acceptance. Um, beauty, it's beauty is that 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 there's even going back to myself. I have a gap in my teeth, and for a long time I try to put braces to close it up. Mm-hmm. And then I just learned to ex- accept and embrace my gap. Then I'm not Michael Strahan has a gap. <laughs> <laughs> that was his <laughs> April Fool's uh, joke. He actually pretended that he closed his gap, and then he was like, "I've been, you know, I've had this gap for fifty years. I'm keeping it." So for the longest time, I never smiled, and then I never <gasps> talked. That's why I never talked in class. She, um, and what what kills me, Jackie, is uh, Kanye's part of this beautiful college program that we're doing now at Waldorf University. And the stories that Kanye writes, um, they made me cry when she was in high school, they made me cry now that she's in college. But the way you you write about when you were a child, um, I didn't know that side of you because I just saw this little angel, this little lotus Mm -hmm. flower. 
I didn't know that tough side of you that was being bullied. I didn't know that tough side of you that was being chased home. I didn't know that tough side of you. The way you dress in the film is how she dressed, baggy pants. And um, what you don't know is Jackie had a little bit of an edge. And that was kind of the the marching orders for um, the casting director and our screenwriter is find young people who embody freedom writers. So even though you didn't know Kanye, they did. Even though you didn't know Bunny, they did. So when they found you, it was almost like this accidentally on purpose. Yeah. So you kind of brought an edge to our film because you have a little bit of an edge, which I love when I say that yeah. with the deepest of respect. Yeah, no, um, I'm you're proud, very proud of, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was kind of amazing. I feel like Freedom Writers found me. You guys did find me because I was uh, doing just like theater, like next in this really great uh, nonprofit organization next to my high school. I went to Fairfax High School. I was doing this after school program just to keep me out of trouble, basically. Uh, and you were a teenager. Yeah, I was, yeah I, was, uh, I was 16 years old. Yeah. We love that. Um, uh, at Greenway Arts uh, Theater, Greenway Arts Alliance, Greenway Court Theater. And one of my mentors was just like, you know what, they're doing an open casting call for this movie. They're looking for, for, for real life like kids, like, you know, and I think this sounds like you. And it's kind of funny because they were like, yeah, I think I saw a breakdown where it said like uh, Asian and Latin maybe mixed or something. And then I was like, and then she was like, that sounds like you. I was like, well, I'm Filipino. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of like this running joke about like Filipinos being like, you know, or again, like, Southeast Asian people being not like not East Asian being like the the, the darker skin Asian the you know as Ali Wong says like the jungle Asian the the brown Asian you know and I was like oh yeah that sounds like I could go for that role you know and I, I showed up and I had never acted professionally in my life but I was all punked out I used to be a punk like then you know and like and um, so I, and I had hair similar to this now actually which is kind of funny. And I was just like really rough around the edges, and I just showed up, and I just read, and they were like, you know, and then they kept calling me back. It was your eureka. It was it was a eureka moment. Yeah, and then they just kept calling me back, and I was like, oh really? I I went for fun because I just thought, I was like, how cool would that be to audition for a movie? I could tell my grandkids that that I auditioned for a movie one, you know, when I was a kid. I just thought that that was a cool idea, and I didn't think that I would get it. You know, I think was so amazing about uh, the Freedom Riders, Kanye and Bunny didn't want it to be this polished actress yeah, from Disney or right. Nickelodeon. No, no offense to either of those institutions, yeah, yeah. but they didn't want someone who was 43 mm-hmm. playing a 16 year old. They wanted a 16 year old playing a 16 yeah, year old. So yeah. that I think is amazing. Yeah. I, I remember um, Hunter, who plays Ben in the film, yeah. having to defend your honor one day. And he was so excited because in the film, he's the, the singular Caucasian kid. Yeah. And I remember there was a, a little skirmish on the set one day. Yeah. Um, I think with the next boyfriend of yours. Yeah. Oh and my god. And he was, that was so terrible. excited. Oh, that was drama. <laughs> well, it was drama, but he felt like that, that as you were making the film, yeah. you were having this parallel life that the Freedom Riders had. Yeah. You guys became a family. Yeah. You guys were growing together, and so for him to defend your honor, oh my god. felt the way Freedom Riders felt when they defended your honor. Yeah. And so I don't know if you realize for Hunter, that was a really cool moment. It was scary. Yeah. But it made it a little bit real that you know yeah. that you guys were becoming a family as well. Oh my god. Yeah. It's insane. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. I mean that that whole thing was crazy. It was very just like oh my god. Yeah. My real because I felt the whole experience for me was very surreal because I I don't come I, I come from very like working class family where you know they're just like just stay in school stay out of trouble and like just please don't have, you know, just all these things of like they didn't really it was just very like how am I on this set right now like how am I in a movie right now it's insane like that was not something that I felt like anyone would have ever imagined for someone like me like mm-hmm. that was so insane I was like it that just changed my life completely mm-hmm. and so when that, <laughs> the crazy ex boyfriend came on set and caused a ruckus I was like oh my god this is like my crazy life real life <laughs> you know like I grew up in K-Town Koreatown and like and I was just like oh my god this is like my really kind of ghetto ruckus life coming on here and kind of ruining it I'm like no but that's but that's our life that's why we love you <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so it was just like you're you're with your people. Oh my god, <laughs> it was insane, and I'm oh I'm extreme. Oh my god, yes, it's thank you. You were with your <laughs> people. You. Yes, 
<laughs> like, thank you, universe. Thank you. So, um, speaking of being with your people, how could we take listeners and watchers and, and make them feel that they're always with their people, regardless of skin color, shades, hues, um, sides of the street they come from. I think what you guys have really done like passionately is, uh, besides making everyone cry, to feel that they can stand up, mm-hmm. to feel that they no longer need to be silent, to feel that they can confront somebody in the line at a grocery store or mm-hmm. in a classroom or even on a Zoom meeting. Mm-hmm. So what could be something that you could tell to the youth now who are watching? who are impressionable, who've read your book, who've seen your movie, what can you directly tell a child to stop the madness? I would say that if they see anything or hear anything, stand up, tell somebody, speak to somebody about it, get it out of their system to be seen and be heard, but not from a place of violence. We don't need to go there. Mm-hmm. Don't fight fire with fire. Did you, did you hear that? I know. I know. I tell myself every day. <laughs> Be the bigger person. Yes. You know, I really think that we need to get rid of this race thing. Mm-hmm. We're all one human race. Mm-hmm. We're not. We're different countries and location and have different styles and beauty, but we're all one Earth mm-hmm. and it's one humanity. Mm-hmm. Whenever we think like that, it's more holistic. When we separate ourselves and think, and then it becomes like, oh, I'm better, that's, you're this, I'm that. No, it's not. We all bleed the same. Mm -hmm. We're all feeling the pain. You know, the pandemic has taken lives, bring about issues that we never wanted to think about and talk about. It's all coming up to surface that because it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. The more we oppress it and suppress it and saying that everything's all right, it's not all right. It's coming out for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out for a reason, not so that we can perpetuate the same thing that's been happening. It's coming out for a reason so that we finally detox this and get rid of it. Because I am sick and tired of this shit. Yes. Mm, Amen. And did you hear that kids at home? We don't censor. Um, yeah. Accidentally on purpose. Can you see the embodiment yeah. of the spirit? Uh, you were chosen for a reason. So, in that spirit and in that feist, um, take that fire that you have. Yeah. What would you say oh, to yeah. a kid at home? No, I mean absolutely. I, I, I'm, you know, just to piggyback on everything Kanye just said. Absolutely, say something, take action, and but also express. I think, yeah, the more we suppress, the more we repress, that's the more the violence inside boils over and then all these ugly things start happening and and coming out in all these weird ways. Um, Absolutely, I agree with everything Honey just said, but I think, you know, I think the number one thing is to always, and it sounds a little cheesy, but it's absolutely true. You have to have hope and you have to believe and it has to be unwavering. Mm -hmm. Like it starts deep, deep down inside. You have to believe and know that you are strong, you are worthwhile, you are, and every, and, and the same thing goes with everyone around you, that, that, that we are in this together. Mm -hmm. It has to be this unwavering belief that like, I'm human and we are all human and we can really come together and do this. Because I think, and you, in order to, I think, really believe in that, you have to have hope. Mm-hmm. And I think so much of the, the, the violence that's happening is coming from a place of just devoid, of like no hope, of hopelessness, of sadness, of trauma, mm-hmm. of um, feeling forgotten, of feeling invisible. And we need to remember and we need to believe we are visible, we are here, and we count. Absolutely, a thousand percent. Uh- you read words for a living. I think you need to write words for a living. Spoken from a, a fellow bestselling author. Um, that was amazing. Oh, thank That's you. a drop the mic moment. Hi, my name is Jackie Nan, and I'm here to say stop Asian hate. Hi, I'm Erin Gruwell. Join us in stopping Asian hate. Hi, I'm Kanye Sim. We need to stop the Asian hate as of now. The Freedom Writer story has been published as a book, filmed by a Hollywood studio, and captured in a gritty, heart-rending documentary. In whatever form it's taken, 
The story has inspired and touched people all over the world, and the story continues today. Aaron Gruel and the Freedom Writers created the Freedom Writers Foundation to provide educators with tools to empower all students to succeed. Through training programs, speaking engagements, scholarships, curricula, and digital content, the Foundation is here to engage, enlighten, and empower you to make a difference. Everyone can teach one to teach another. Miss G and her students opened their hearts to the true power of education. Now, it's your turn.